This hearing will come to order. And without objection, the chair is authorized to declare recess at any time. Let me say good morning and welcome to everyone, most especially our witnesses. This is our first hearing on the Committee of Science, Space, and Technology of the second session of the 116th Congress. And we are delighted that our experts have come and agreed to participate, um, as was the case at our first hearing this, this committee held in the 116th Congress, we are focusing on the climate crisis. Specifically, we are discussing the latest science and the solutions we urgently need to implement. Since that inaugural climate hearing in February 2019, I'm proud to say that this committee has held numerous hearings examining the climate crisis and moved a number of important climate-related bills to the committee so far. The hearings have discussed major climate reports, considered technological and energy solutions, and assessed how the U.S. can remain a global leader in weather and climate science. Members have been hard at work on a suite of legislative proposals that will improve our earth system science and deep decarbonization efforts, including the authorization of strategic increases in funding for clean energy research and development where it's most needed. Despite these accomplishments, there remains more work to do to ensure that the United States can better understand, mitigate, and adapt to climate change. Today, our expert witnesses will testify that time is quickly running out to prevent devastating impacts to humans and ecosystems globally. However, I hope they will also emphasize that though the situation is urgent, it is not hopeless. There's much we can achieve with our current technologies and other potential solutions ripe for further investment. Climate change is not just a future issue. Our witnesses will testify about the real and devastating impacts that are being felt now in communities across the United States and the world. Record heat and drought in Australia, which current science links to human-caused climate change, have created a catastrophic fires that continue to blaze. Though this administration has so far abdicated its role as a leader in addressing this climate crisis, many of us in Congress are committed to addressing all aspects of this global threat. Last month, a number of my colleagues and I attended the 25th UN Conference of Parties, or the COP25 in Madrid, Spain. Uh, we went to demonstrate the U.S.'s continued commitment to the ideals laid out in the Paris Agreement. While it was disappointing to see the outcome of the, of the uh, COP, I look forward to continuing our efforts to act on climate change here in this committee and in Congress as a whole. During this second session, I hope to continue collaborating across the aisle to pass legislation that helps us address climate change. And this hearing is an important step in that process. Now, I'd like to enter into the record a letter from the National Parks Conservation Association. The letter briefly outlines the importance of science to national parks, especially in the, re in the reality of a change in climate. I now will recognize our ranking member, Mr. Lucas, for his opening statement. Thank you, Chairwoman Johnson. As we start this second session of the 116th Congress, I want to thank you for your leadership. And like many of the hearings we held this last year, today's hearing is an opportunity for a constructive dialogue on the issue of climate change. Almost a year ago, we held the Science Committee's first hearing of the Congress titled The State of Climate Science and Why It Matters. We heard testimony from a similar panel of IPCC authors and scientists. We know the climate is changing and that global industrial activity has played a role in this phenomenon. But now one year later, I ask, what progress have we made since then? I believe my friends on the other side of the aisle agree with me that the most effective thing we can do on this committee is to address climate change, is to support more basic research that will lead to the next generation of technologies that are needed to reduce global emissions, like carbon capture, nuclear power, fusion energy. 
I'm disappointed that we haven't taken that action, and instead of supporting the technologies of the future, we have focused our attention in the past year on applying research in industries like wind and solar that are already thriving. I'm also disappointed in the headlines that put a ticking clock on our destruction at the hands of climate change. This is counterproductive to promoting both science and solutions. These doomsday scenarios and apocalyptic predictions are misleading because the U.S. is already taking action through investments in the science and innovation needed for cleaner energy production. We won't successfully address greenhouse gas emissions with pie-in-the-sky policies that demand 100% renewable energy at the expense of reliable power from nuclear and fossil fuels. This is why only ra this would only raise energy prices for businesses and consumers and potentially cripple the American economy. Today, the market exists for implementing groundbreaking technologies. Government investment in basic research has led to the development of carbon capture, carbon use, advanced nuclear, and renewable energy technologies that will incentivize growth in these industries and reduce global emissions in the process. Innovation is good for the global environment and the American economy. We have to take the long-term approach and make investments in research that will lead to the new technologies. Federal mandates to deploy today's technologies won't revolutionize the energy market. They won't lead to the next big discovery. For instance, the current U.S. battery capacity is just one gigawatt. If we were to meet the radical and frankly unrealistic goal of 100% renewable energy by 2050, we would need 3,300 gigawatts of battery capacity to accommodate the necessary solar and, winter power and wind power. So if we want to see more renewable energy, we need to invest in the kind of fundamental chemistry and materials research that will lead to affordable, scalable batteries. The Department of Energy is developing a range of technologies at our national labs, like carbon capture, advanced nuclear reactors, that have the potential to reduce new greenhouse gas emissions around the world and ensure American energy dominance. It's unrealistic to limit our future energy mix to only renewable energy. As we've heard from, we will hear from one of our witnesses, Mr. Michael Schellenberg, nuclear power is an incredible resource that is and will continue to be a critical piece of the puzzle in addressing climate change. Nuclear power is safe, clean, reliable, and growing more affordable by the day. Private companies are developing advanced reactors that provide clean, carbon-free power. With support from DOE, these advanced technologies could provide cheap, reliable, emissions-free power around the world. But in order for this to happen, we can't uh, let scare tactics allow us to abandon our promising technology. America led the world in coal, oil, and gas. Now we must again lead and partner with industry to develop breakthrough energy technologies and make our existing energy sources cleaner and more affordable. Prioritizing investment in basic science and energy research will revolutionize the global energy market and dramatically reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We have the tools and expertise to take on the next generation of technology challenges, including a changing environment, climate I should say. We have a common goal. I'm more encouraged than ever that we are on the right track, but I ask my colleagues, let's move on from the finger pointing and focus on tangible innovation and realistic solutions. I thank our witnesses for being here today, and I very much look forward to a productive discussion about these issues. And with that, I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. If there are other members who wish to submit additional opening statements, your statements will be added to the record at this point. At this time, I'd like to introduce our witnesses. Our first distinguished witness is Dr. Pamela McElwee, an associate professor of human ecology in the School of Environment and Biological Sciences at Rutgers. Uh, Dr. Um, McElwee is um, the interdisciplinary environmental scientist whose research focuses on ecosystem services and resource use in the context of environmental changes. She was a lead author of the chapter six of the IPCC Special Report on Climate Change and Land on Integrated Response Options, and lead author for Chapter 6 on Biodiversity Governance of the Global Assessment of the Intergovernmental Panel of Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. 
She received a PhD in forestry and environmental studies and anthropology at Yale University. A second witness, Dr. Richard Murray, is Deputy Director and Vice President for Research at the Woods Hole Oce Oceanographic Institution. Mr. Murray is a geochemist whose research focuses on interpreting chemical records of climate change, volcanism, and tropical oceanographic processes. He previously served as Director of the Division of Ocean Scientists at the National Science Foundation and as a co-chair for the Subcommittee on Ocean Science and Technology <laughs> as part of the Office of Science and Technology Policy. Dr. Murray received his PhD from the University of California at Berkeley. Our third witness, Dr. Heidi Seltzer, a professor of environment and sustainability at Fort, Fort Lewis College in Colorado. Her research focuses on how environmental changes affect mountain watersheds and, and Arctic ecosystems, and they're linked to our well being. She has spent 25 years conducting field studies in mountain and Arctic hill slopes in Colorado, Alaska, Greenland, and China. She was a lead author for the chapter on high mountain areas in the IPCC special report on the oceans and cryptosphere and our changing climate. Dr. Uh, Stelzer earned her PhD in ecosystem ecology from the University of Colorado in Boulder. I knew I'd hear a voice. <laughs> Our fourth witness is Mr. Michael Schellenberger, founder and president of Environmental Progress. Mr. Schellenberger has been an, an environmentalist and social justice advocate for over 25 years. He has worked to preserve California's redwood forests and advocate for clean energy investment. He founded environmental progress with the goals of lifting all people out of poverty and saving the natural environment. Mr. Schellenberger graduated from the Peace and Global Studies program at, at Earlham College. And our final witness is Ms. Taryn Franson, a senior fellow in the Global Climate Program at the World Resources Institute. Ms. Franson is an international climate policy expert who focuses on pathways and policies to limit climate change, including long-term strategies and nationally determ determined contributions under the Paris Agreement. She was a lead author of the United Nations Environmental Program Emissions Gap Report. She received a master's degree in Earth System at Stanford University and is pursuing doctoral studies in energy and resource group at the University of California at Berkeley. As our witnesses should know, you will each have five minutes for your written spoken testimony, for your spoke, spoken testimony. Your written testimony will be included in the record for the hearing. When all of you have completed your spoken testimony, we will begin with questions and each member will have five minutes to question the panel. So we will start now with Dr. McElwee. Great. Thank you, Chairwoman Johnson, Ranking Member Lucas, and committee members for inviting me to speak today. My name is Pam McElwee, and I'm an associate professor at Rutgers University. My research focuses on human vulnerability to global climate change and the impact of policies for land-based mitigation. I served as one of nearly 100 authors of the IPCC Climate Change and Land Report and was invited here to speak to the findings of that report, and I'm doing so in my personal capacity. IPCC reports serve as the most authoritative assessments of current climate science. The Land Report is one of three special reports that have been completed in this assessment cycle, along with the 1.5 degrees report that came out last year, the Oceans and Cryosphere report that my fellow witnesses will speak about as well. So let me provide an overview of what the key findings from the Land Report were. First, land is under growing pressure. Currently, human use directly affects more than 70% of the global land surface, encompassing all the things that we do, from growing crops, producing timber, managing pastures, and sheltering ourselves. However, 
These activities are putting increasing pressure on land and biodiversity, including through land-based emissions of greenhouse gases. Further, the rising impacts of climate change are already visible in many of our terrestrial ecosystems, and changes in land use can in turn amplify these signals. Secondly, land can be part of the solution. Luckily, there are multiple options to achieve better land stewardship and reduced emissions, such as through sustainable land management, improved food systems, and conserving priority ecosystems. However, the report's third and final key message is that land cannot do it all. There is a finite amount of land, and it's often under intense competition. There are limits to what land can do for us in terms of mitigation without incurring sustainability trade-offs, and the land sector cannot fully make up for failing to tackle fossil fuel emissions elsewhere. So let me put some of these points in a bit more context. Since the pre-industrial period, the land surface air temperature has risen nearly twice as much as the global average temperature, and it is now at more than 1.5 degrees Celsius. These temperature changes create stresses on land, ranging from impacts on livelihoods, biodiversity, human and ecosystem health, infrastructure, and food systems. In the US, our land systems are already feeling climate change impacts, including heat and drought, extending the wildfire risk season in California, and extreme rainfall events last spring in the Midwest. Additional emissions in the future will increase the impacts on land and ecosystems. The frequency and intensity of droughts are, expect, are projected to increase both globally and in the United States, as are the frequency and intensity of extreme rainfall events. For forests, we expect to see increases in the intensity and frequency of wildfires. As we are seeing play out in Australia right now, warmer and drier conditions facilitate fires that spread over larger areas and are harder to contain. Food security is also at risk. We already see food systems affected by heat, changing precipitation patterns, and more extreme events. Future climate changes are projected to result in crop yield declines, increased prices, nu uh, reduced nutrient levels and quality, and supply chain disruptions. All of these risks to land systems escalate with increasing temperatures. Yet despite these problems, we have a number of solutions that are ready and available for us to use and at low cost. Land is really the only major sector where we can not only reduce emissions, but offset emissions from other sectors as well, creating a tremendous opportunity for farmers, ranchers, and other land managers. For example, sustainable land use both reduces emissions and degradation and helps us adapt to climate changes. Improvement in soil health will increase carbon sequestration, improve farm productivity, and can secure new revenue streams. Reforestation and restoration are win-wins as well, providing both short-term positive economic returns and longer-term benefits in terms of adaptation and mitigation. Other nature-based solutions, like conservation of critical ecosystems, have the potential to provide significant climate mitigation impacts as well. Improving our food production and consumption systems can also be a win-win if we focus on increased, increased food productivity, improved distribution and access, better dietary choices, and reduced food losses and waste. So I personally grew up in a small farm in eastern Kansas from a long line of farmers. I understand how much our rural economies love the land and cherish being part of our great agricultural economy. But the challenges they and we face are increasingly serious. Rapid reductions in anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions across all sectors, including fossil fuels and land, would substantially reduce the negative impacts of climate change on ecosystems and people. Thank you for having me here today. Thank you very much, Dr. Murray. Chairwoman Johnson, Ranking Member Lucas, members of the committee. My name is Richard Murray. I'm the Deputy Director and Vice President for Research at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. We're the world's largest independent, nonprofit ocean research institution and have nearly 1,000 staff dedicated to ocean science, engineering, and education. Thank you for the opportunity to address you today on behalf of the broader US ocean science community. I have three main takeaway points for you today. First, the ocean is central to Earth's climate and weather systems, as well as our economic growth and national security, and must be included in any discussion regarding legislation and policy addressing the environmental changes we see today. Second, we as a nation must make bold and innovative investments in ocean observations. 
because this quantitative data is essential in order to improve climate and weather predictions and our ability to make difficult decisions about how we manage the future. Third, the integration of climate and weather modeling with risk assessment and risk management models is needed to help align climate and economic policies that have the potential for dramatic and positive effect on the U.S. for generations to come. All of this relies on increasing and improving the quality of data throughout the world's oceans. You specifically requested that I address the 2019 IPCC special report on the ocean and cryosphere in a changing climate. This extensively peer-reviewed document marks a milestone in IPCC reports because it assesses comprehensively the role of the ocean in our planet's climate system and identifies the many ways that a changing climate influences and is influenced by the ocean. The IPCC reports the result of more than 100 scientists from 36 countries who referenced nearly 7,000 scientific publications and addressed over 31,000 comments from reviewers. The language in the report is very carefully chosen to depict the level of scientific certainty in its findings. It states that the ocean is changing in fundamental and complex ways that should be of concern to even the most landlocked of us. These findings document some basic truths. The ocean is warming. Sea levels are rising, sea ice is disappearing, surface waters are becoming more acidic, and oxygen minimum zones within the ocean depths are expanding. Of increasing concern is that it appears that the rate at which these changes are taking place is accelerating. It is not linear, nor is it steady. The evidence is clearly indicating that human activity has played a significant role in these changes. But much of what is happening in the ocean is occurring over the horizon, deep beneath the surface, and over long periods of time. As a result, it's difficult for humans to sense or to understand what is happening. Only through decades-long observations and a comprehensive look at the ocean's distant past, recorded in cores of ice from land and in sediment from the seafloor, have we come to understand the scope and nature of our changing planet. But it's not enough. We need to learn more about our oceans in places we've never been and for longer than we've ever been there. The ocean drives the weather that helps put food on our tables and is a foundation of local, state, and regional economies that total billions, if not trillions, of dollars per year. And it's not just places near the shore that should pay attention. For example, studies show that floods throughout the Mississippi River Valley in 2019, as far north as Minnesota, were directly tied to weather patterns originating in the waters of the Gulf of Mexico and the Pacific Ocean. So it is with good reason that we take notice of the IPCC report, particularly because its findings are based on the best available scientific data and conclusions. Now, it troubles some folks that alongside these findings, the conclusions awful inc often include levels of certainty or uncertainty, which is often perceived as a weakness of science. In fact, the opposite is true. Some of the findings have lower certainty because we need better observations. This shows where we should turn our attention in order to improve our understanding and decrease that uncertainty. This is a hallmark of the scientific process. Ocean observations are expensive and difficult to make, particularly in places like the Arctic and the Southern Oceans. The ocean as a whole is vast, harsh, constantly changing. So what are we to do? We must invest in the infrastructure, technology, and instrumentation of ocean observations to help make the ocean transparent to us. To study the ocean, you have to go out onto it and down into it, which is something the ocean science community specializes in. With your continuing support for ocean science, expanding observational capability, and for developing the engineering and technological means and workforce to achieve such capability, we can help address the challenges that face us and generate the best information possible to help inform private, public, and business cost-benefit decisions. I thank you again for the opportunity to appear before you. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Dr. Stelzer. Chairwoman Johnson, Ranking Member Lucas, and members of the House Committee on Science, Space, and Technology, I'm grateful for the invitation to be here with you all today. I'm a scientist, an explorer, and a science communicator. I prefer to go where the temperatures are cool, the snow is deep, the plants are small, and the opportunity for collaborative science to understand our planet is huge. I have conducted field studies in remote mountain and polar regions for 25 years in Colorado, 
Alaska, Greenland, and most recently on the Tibetan Plateau in China. I'm a professor at Fort Lewis College, which is in Durango, Colorado, in the Four Corners region. The United States is not the most vulnerable nation to climate change, though we have already been and will continue to be impacted. It is difficult to comprehend what the costs of further inaction could be. Many of the cryospheric changes described in the most recent IPCC report, the one that Dr. Murray also spoke of, and further summarized in the Cryosphere 1.5C report that I provided as part of my testimony, may seem far away in time or in space. The cryosphere is the frozen water on our planet. It's the regions of Earth, uh, the regions across the Earth where the snow, where there is snow, permafrost, permanently frozen ground, and ice. In these regions, what, we, what are we seeing? We're seeing rapid ice sheet de deterioration in Antarctica. Fall and perhaps soon a winter without Arctic sea ice. Increasingly more unfrozen ground across Russia, Northern Europe, and North America, including Alaska. Disappearing mountain glaciers in Peru and mountains with less snow. Due to the volume of ice and greater present, per, sorry, and the greater permanence when ice is lost, the changes to snow may be overlooked by the media and policymakers. But these changes in snow are not overlooked by the farmers, the ranchers, the water managers, the skiers, and the business owners in the community where I live. In my community on the western slope of Colorado, we talk about snow a lot. We talk about climate change. We talk about less snow, we talk about wildfire, and we talk about all those things amidst also talking about powder days, recent adventures, and how our children are doing. We don't often talk in rural western Colorado about Arctic sea ice or ice sheets in Antarctica, though these two will affect us. What are some of the ways the cryosphere is changing that should be discussed more across all of America? Changes to ice are irreversible on timescales that are relevant for policy. Abrupt processes occur. We know of some of these, but not all. And by their nature, we don't know when they'll occur. And in the world's mountains, not just in the US mountains, the presence and persistence of snow is changing. There is less snow. In every community across the United States, temperature extremes are affected by cryospheric changes that influence air circulation. Melting ice affects the rate of sea level rise in coastal regions. The loss of ice and thaw of permafrost affect the acceleration of warming and melting, and the chance to keep our planet below 1.5 C warming over pre-industrial times. More extreme temperatures, less reliable water, and the pace of these changes affect food, energy, and water supply. There is much we can do. So what can we do? Our country should aim to be a resilient nation. Resilience is coping capacity. It's coping capacity in response to unknown shocks, trends, or stresses. Resilience includes the capacity to adapt and to transform to reduce the impact of climate change or other environmental changes. Individuals, communities, and nations can be resilient, and our nation should aim to be a resilient nation. What motivated me to pursue a career in science may be similar to what motivates many of you to be members of Congress. The opportunity to do some good for others. We can work to achieve this together. Three of my recommendations parallel ones many people in the international world have heard recently. Some of our steps forward can be to protect lands that have not yet been transformed by our actions. The value of land that we have not yet changed is immense. We can restore lands that have been transformed so that they store more carbon, hold on to more soil, and reduce the impact of extreme weather events. We can fund both of these uh, efforts. Federal funding for lands protection and restoration form the foundation for communities to be resilient. The one other piece that I'd like to add that I think parallels some of what was shared by Mr. Lucas is that we can develop a new narrative about climate change. And where and how we tell stories is a really important part of climate change. We often focus a lot on what is lost, what is irreversible, and what is harmful, and I felt I needed to speak to that, but we can also focus on what we can do differently. Snow, 
Plants and soil are renewable resources. We can work to build capacity for the lands to be more vibrant and more healthy and more green and for there to be more snowfall once again across the U.S. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Schellenberger. Good morning, Chairwoman Johnson, Ranking Member Lucas, and members of the committee. I'm very honored to be here. I'm an energy analyst and environmentalist dedicated to the goals of universal prosperity, peace, and environmental protection. Between 20, 2003 and 2009, I advocated for large federal investments in renewables, many of which were made as part of the 2009 stimulus. And since 2013, I've worked with climate scientists for the continued operation of nuclear plants around the world and have helped prevent emissions from increasing the equivalent of adding 23 million cars to the road. I also care about getting the facts and the science right. I believe scientists, journalists, and advocates have an obligation to represent climate science accurately, even if doing so reduces the saliency of our issue. No credible scientific body has claimed climate change threatens the collapse of civilization, much less the extinction of the human species, and yet some activists, scientists, and journalists have made such apocalyptic assertions which I believe contribute to rising levels of anxiety, including among adolescents and worsening political polarization. My colleagues and I have carefully reviewed the science, interviewed the scientists and other individuals who have been making these claims, and written a series of articles debunking them. In response, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has invited me to review its next assessment report, and HarperCollins will publish our research findings as a book this June. While climate change may make some natural disasters more frequent and extreme, the death toll from extreme events could and should continue to decline, as it did over the last century by over 90%, even as the global population quadrupled. Does that mean we shouldn't worry about climate change? Of course not. Policymakers routinely take action on non-apocalyptic problems, and the risk of crossing unknown tipping points rises with higher temperatures. But we should recognize that humans are not passive victims of environmental change. The Netherlands grew very rich while farming up to seven meters below sea level. Poor nations like Bangladesh can and should manage a gradual sea level rise of two feet over the next 80 years. In fact, they're working with the Dutch on that very project right now. Future food production will depend far more on whether poor farmers gain access to tractors, irrigation, and fertilizer than temperature rise according to the best available science assembled by the Food and Agriculture Organization, which calculates crop yields will continue to rise even in high warming scenarios. And there's much we can do to reduce the impacts of climate-driven extremes. For example, the most important factors behind rising severity and frequency of fires in California and Australia are the buildup of wood fuel in forests and the expansion of homes and other buildings in fire-prone areas both of which can be addressed to protect human lives and those of endangered species. While the world appears to be headed to temperature rise closer to three degrees centigrade over pre-industrial temperatures rather than four, thanks largely to abundant natural gas, nothing is guaranteed. As such, the American people have an interest in supporting reasonable measures to transition from carbon, intense, carbon intensive to low carbon fuels in order to prevent global temperatures from increasing by more than three degrees. The most important of these measures by far is the expanded use of nuclear energy. Thanks in part to decades of public and private investment in fracking, natural gas is today cheap and abundant and thus needs little in terms of new public policy. Solar and wind are popular, but their inherent unreliability, large land use requirements, and large materials requirements mean they make electricity expensive, have large environmental impacts, and are inherently limited in their capacity to replace fossil fuels. Consumers in states with renewable energy standards spent $125 billion more for electricity than they would have other, otherwise over the last decade, according to University of Chicago economists in a research report last year. Sh Germany spent 32 billion euros annually on renewables, which is the equivalent of the U.S. spending $200 billion annually between 2014 and 2018, only to increase its share of electricity from solar and wind by 11 percentage points. French electricity, which is 72%, which 72 nuclear, produces one-tenth of the carbon emissions as renewables heavy German electricity at nearly half the price. The U.S. invented nuclear energy for civilian use in the 1950s, and yet over three-quarters of new nuclear reactors globally are being built by the Chinese and Russians. Everyone recognizes that for the U.S. to compete in building nuclear plants abroad, we must build them at home, and yet electric utilities may close half of America's nuclear plants over the next two decades. 
While the nuclear industry deserves great credit for the continuous improvement of power plant safety and efficiency, many utility executives today are either resigned to the technology's decline or engaged in wishful thinking. Even were utilities to replace every nuclear plant it closes with small modular reactors, the electricity generated would be roughly two-thirds less. And if nations were to one day opt for smaller reactors, they would likely purchase them from those nations that offer the most favorable financial terms and have the most experience, which is Russia and China. Given all of that, I would like to pose three questions as a public interest advocate of the environment and of nuclear. First, is it in the interest of taxpayers to subsidize U.S. electric utilities to operate existing nuclear plants in the absence of any commitment to build new nuclear plants? Second, does Congress believe the U.S. can compete with China and Russia while shutting down half to two-thirds of its nuclear fleet? Third, is Congress really comfortable standing by and watching dozens of na nations partner with China and Russia to expand their use of nuclear over the next century? If the answer to the latter question is yes, I think Congress should inform the American people that it has decided to cede America's historic role as creator, promoter, and steward of the world's most sensitive dual-use technology to our main geopolitical rivals. In the 1950s, members of Congress understood the sensitive and special nature of this technology and pressured a distracted White House to make American dominance of nuclear energy a top national security priority. I think that uh, the same thing is required today. We need a new act of Congress, perhaps a revision to the Atomic Energy Act, and perhaps we should call it a green nuclear deal in recognition of its importance, not just to national security, but also to the economy, the environment, and the climate. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And Mr. Fran uh, sorry, Ms. Franson. Chairwoman Johnson, Ranking Member Lucas, and members of the committee, Thank you for inviting me to testify today on the UNEP Emissions Gap Report. My name is Taryn Franson, and I'm a senior fellow at the World Resources Institute, a nonprofit, nonpartisan environmental think tank. My work focuses on greenhouse gas emissions pathways, and I've been a lead author of the Emissions Gap Report since its third edition in 2012. The emissions gap refers to the difference between where global greenhouse gas emissions are currently headed and where they need to be headed in order to limit warming to 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius and avoid its worst impacts. For the past 10 years, under the auspices of the Gap Report, the UN Environment Program has convened dozens of researchers from around the world to conduct a rigorous peer-reviewed assessment of the scientific literature to quantify the gap. And I have to tell you, when I think about the emissions gap, what troubles me is less that people sometimes say unscientific things about it, although that does occur, and more that the actions of too many of our leaders are profoundly out of sync with what the science is telling us we need to do in order to close the gap. I'll tell you a bit about why, and then I'll touch on what other countries are doing and how Congress can help. Global emissions grew 1.5% per year over the last decade to reach a record high last year. Under current policies, emissions are projected to grow by another 8% over the coming decade. Without these policies, emissions would have grown even more, so we have made some progress. But slowing growth is not enough. Emissions need to be cut nearly in half by 2030 to limit warming to 1.5 degrees. We're instead on track to experience warming of around 3 to 3.5 degrees, with serious consequences for Americans. Temperatures so far have risen around one degree, and that was enough to increase the likelihood of storms like Imelda and Harvey by two to three times, taking lives and causing billions in damage. With impacts like these and worse projected around the world, you can understand why the Pentagon considers climate change a threat multiplier. Looking out to 2030, we find that emissions under current policies and pledges are more than one third higher than in two degree scenarios and more than double 1.5 scenarios. This translates to the need for very steep emissions reductions over the next decade and beyond. So to recap, the emissions gap is large, it threatens American prosperity and security, and the window to close it is shrinking. Several additional pieces of global context should inform how we respond to the emissions gap. First, the emissions gap does not mean that the Paris Agreement isn't working. On the contrary, the gap is smaller with the pledges under Paris than it would be without them. Second, the gap does not indicate that climate action has stalled everywhere. At last count, the number of climate policies around the world had risen to around 1,500. Major emitters are among those taking action. Over the last decade, China has invested twice as much in renewable energy as has the United States. 
India is aiming to quintuple its renewable capacity by 2030. But this is only one side of the coin. Even as China greens its own economy, it continues to finance coal infrastructure abroad. In Brazil, deforestation is up 30%. And here at home, the Trump administration is in the process of rolling back more than 90 environmental regulations. We will not close the emissions gap unless countries like these change course. As the world's largest economy with its tremendous diplomatic clout, the US is uniquely positioned not only to go green itself, but also to influence other countries to do the same. Congress can do three things to help. First, Congress should pass ambitious legislation to cut emissions. Recent analysis by the University of Maryland, the Rocky Mountain Institute, and WRI outlines an all-in policy package that can cut US emissions nearly in half by 2030, while generating economic benefits. Second, Congress should position the US to fully re-engage in climate diplomacy and play a strong role in driving the Paris Agreement should it stay in or rejoin. One important avenue is to build on successful bipartisan efforts to maintain international funding for clean energy, forest protection, and resilience. Finally, while ambitious near-term action is possible with existing technology, further innovation can broaden our options for ultimately driving net global emissions down to zero. Therefore, Congress should ramp up RD&D funding for clean energy and carbon removal. The current emissions gap puts us on track to experience a dangerous degree of warming. While closing the gap will require actions from all countries, US leadership is especially important. We need to pass ambitious near-term emissions cuts, position the US to conduct robust climate diplomacy, and ramp up investment in r and The alternative, rolling back progress at home and disengaging internationally, will only serve as a convenient excuse for those who would rather avoid action. With only a decade to cut our emissions in half, our future hangs in the balance. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we now have completed the testimony of our witnesses, and at this point, we will begin our first rounds of questions, and I recognize myself for five minutes. The climate change crisis is um, the largest existential threat that we face today and has long-term implications that will impact future generations. In order to foster climate resilience and sustainability development, there must be sustained, effective coordination and ambitious efforts for both adaptation and mitigation. I've often called this committee the Committee of the Future because many impactful scientific discoveries have come from or were supported by agencies within our jurisdiction. Given this long history of robo, robos, robust scientific investment, I'd like each of you, time permitting, to comment on what are the most urgent mitigation adaptation needs and what are the greatest barriers to achieving these goals? What investments should this committee be making in federal research and development efforts in the immediate future or further develop and implement effective mitigation adaptation strategies? And finally, what scale should these investments be made? We'll start with our first witness. Great, thank you for that question. You're absolutely right that we need to focus on both mitigation and adaptation. We're already seeing climate impacts at the degree of temperature change, a little bit under one degree C, that we're already at. We're committed to more, so adaptation is, is crucial. For the land sector, one of the really interesting things is that things that we do for mitigation also can get us adaptation benefits, so we get two in one. Um, so for example, if you think about increasing soil, um, uh, soil's ability to store carbon, that gives us mitigation benefits. It also gives us adaptation benefits. I mentioned in my written testimony that there's evidence that farmers in the Midwest who have been using cover crops and no-till techniques for a while, which encourages um, healthy soils, were actually more likely to be able to plant despite all of the terrible, uh, unseasonable, um, extreme rainfall events we had in the spring. So we get some mitigation benefits and we get some adaptation benefits with some of our actions. Um, and the great news, on, at least on the land sector, is a lot of the things that we can do, we don't need to wait for technological breakthroughs. 
For sure, there are things that we can be doing that would require science investment. I can think of things around genetic engineering in terms of crops to make them more resilient, adaptive. There's some really interesting work that's going on to, for example, um, get grains to be able to fix nitrogen just like our legumes do. There's some really fascinating things that are going on. But at least for the land sector, we don't have to wait for that. There's things that we can do now that get us both adaptation and mitigation. Regarding mitigation, um, first up, there's a, a group called the High Level Panel, which has written a report, and they make some several recommendations that I echo, sort of ocean-based renewable energy, very important. We can look at the transportation sector out in the oceans, uh, look at fisheries, aquaculture, so on, try some study of advanced methods for carbon storage in the seabed, but particularly relevant to the House, I want to draw attention to sort of the the uh, blue carbon, coastal marine ecosystems uh, role. Um, as you're aware, there's a bipartisan uh, bill, Blue Carbon for Our Planet Act, um, and that's a real strong step in the, in the right direction of making a difference in the uh, ocean world. Regarding investments in research, as I spoke uh, about really needing to step up the degree and the amount of our ocean observations. Again, I want to emphasize the importance that has for land. For example, there's some colleagues of ours at Woods Hole Oceanographic who have been studying salinity out in the open ocean. As, warm, as fresh water evaporates from the ocean, it's going to land on land, turn into snow and ice on land, and we can actually measure how much and predict much better what's going on on land by measuring salinity out at sea. So there are very strong ocean land linkages. In terms of scale, I'm not here before you to recommend dollar values other than recommend large scale. This is the time. It's a big planet. The ocean is big. These are big problems. We've made sufficient progress to date, maximizing what we're able to do with the resources provided to us. But it's a huge ocean and a large system. We need to tremendously increase the scale of investment. Thank you. Thank you. I'll focus on four points. Three focused on adaptation first. Uh, let's make sure that the local water managers across the U.S. have the resources they need to know how much water they have and when and how that water is filling reservoirs and streams. Uh, a lot of times the way that they make their decisions, um, they don't have all the information they would need uh, and we can make sure that they have those resources. That would be an adaptation approach. The second one is that we can reduce other stressors. So where and how do you develop a plan for the timeline and flexibility that you need to be adaptive and responsive to change? You make sure that you don't have 10 things that are stressful all at once. So what are some of those other stresses we can manage for? We can protect mountains and snowpack from dust. Dust on snow accelerates this, the rate that snow melts. So much so that it's, it's almost shocking when you see the numbers because it's 30 to 60 day timelines that the snow has gone first. We know that that dust is US dust. We know that that dust is not coming from China. You can um, characterize the isotopes in the, in the dust and see that it's US dust. And so actions that we take across the Western US to manage for dust, across the Great Plains US to manage for dust. The third one is um, uh, increasing knowledge the diversity of knowledge systems that we employ. And that means bringing in diverse people to these spaces and to all spaces where we're doing science. I teach at a majority minority serving institution. 38% of the students at Fort Lewis College are Native American descent. There's a tuition waiver in place that provides for that. Uh, I have learned more from my students in 11 years of education, um, co-learning with them. Um, and where and how can we create spaces that remove barriers to a more inclusive space for, um, for the diversity of wealth and knowledge within this country. And the fourth one that I wanted to make, point I wanted to make is about mitigation. Uh, I recently, on Monday night, learned about the CORE Act. That's something uh, Congress has already supported, and I want to thank you for that. That is fantastic to look and see where and how we can put lands into new types of characterizations to manage for um, mixed use of land in new ways. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you very much. I'm out of time, but I'm going to ask Mr. Schillenberger and, and Ms. Franson if you will submit your response to my question if we don't get around to a second uh, round of questions. And I thank you. 
I now recognize Mr. Lucas. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Schellenberger, just uh, 10 years ago, the idea that the United States would be an ex exporter of oil and gas was almost unthinkable. And I think the last time we did that perhaps was about the time of my birth. And I would note to you, my grandchildren believe that's a very long time ago. <laughs> then the shale revolution came along, led by federal investments in basic research, American industry made it a reality. And I've seen firsthand in my home state of Oklahoma how it all started with research and development at DOE's uh, national labs, followed by tax credits, market reforms, partnerships that led to private investment and innovation. Today, uh, we're reducing emissions around the world with cleaner, more efficient American natural gas. Now that said, it's my hope that nuclear power can follow the same pathway and contribute clean, reliable power around the world. Where are we as a nation in advanced nuclear development and how can we kickstart nuclear energy in the same manner as the shale revolution? Uh, thank you for the, very much for that question. I actually did a, a significant amount of research on the historical origins of the shale revolution. And while there's a number of similarities, there's important differences as well. Um, obviously, you know, the, the biggest one with nuclear is just that it is a dual use technology. And so the main obstacle to nuclear's expansion has always been the fears of its use um, to make weapons. And that's the main reason that I think most progressives and Democrats are, uh, are concerned about it. That was the nature of my opposition to nuclear as a young man. Um, I think where it's similar is that we, the, 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 the shale revolution occurred in the context of significant demand for natural gas. Natural gas has always been viewed as a superior fuel to coal just because of a, a burning much cleaner. Um, it has half the carbon intensity of coal burning. So there was always a significant amount of demand for natural gas. The, we don't have that same demand for nuclear just because it's, it's significantly less popular. I think the other big difference then is that when you look at what's actually succeeded for nuclear, both in the United States historically and uh, with what Russia and China are doing now, is that you have heads of state directly selling nuclear power plants to other heads of state. It's a highly centralized activity. You have a single firm, one or two firms. In the United States, it was General Electric and Westinghouse. In China and Russia right now, it's a single state-owned firm. If somebody calls up the Department of Energy in the United States and says, I want to build an AP-1000, which are the reactors that we're building at Vogel in Georgia, there's really not anybody, it would, you would think it would be Bechtel, but Bechtel is only involved in that Vogel project. They're not actively selling nuclear. So I think we've overemphasized the different nuclear technology designs, which just comes from a community that's very technically oriented. But what makes nuclear successful is when it's really embraced and pushed by both the White House and Congress. And you've got, we've got to be building nuclear power plants in the United States or we're simply not going to be competitive abroad. Expand just a little bit more on the concept about the anti-nuclear sentiment, in, which really first, I guess, came around the 1960s and remains today. Can you talk about uh, what's driving that fear and how the relationship to the broader discussion of some of the uh, predictions about climate change, how all this interacts? Nuclear is special. So we sometimes say we need all these different solutions for climate change, carbon capture and storage, solar, wind, and nuclear. But nuclear is unlike the rest of those. This is a radical technological, revolutionary technological development, both in the dual nature of the technology, the incredible energy density of it, and I think that really we suffered, I think the whole human race suffered a kind of trauma and shock when, the, when we invented the bomb in the 1940s. And then there was a lot of enthusiasm after Adams for Peace in 1953 that we would sort of redeem ourselves for having invented such a horrible weapon with nuclear energy. So there's a lot of enthusiasm in the 50s. But ultimately what happened is that the fears of nuclear weapons transferred themselves, just to use a bit of psychological jargon, onto power plants and anti-nuclear weapons activists somehow imagined that shutting down nuclear power plants would rid the world of nuclear weapons. That's really never gone away. In fact, the apocalyptic concerns that we see around climate change today began with apocalyptic concerns around nuclear weapons. And as the Cold War ended, really those, the, the people that were looking for some kind of secular apocalypse found it with climate change, which is why I think so much of the climate activists and environmentalist community is opposed to nuclear. So I think the only way to overcome, I think, the, I think the main, when you kind of get, I think, to the, the chairwoman's question, what is the main obstacle to significant accelerated decarbonization? It's getting over our fear of this technology. Uh, nuclear energy is our true blessing. It emits almost zero air and water pollution. 
In my view, it's the only true replacement of fossil fuels. Renewables are just too energy dilute and intermittent to be able to do that. So we need some kind of a, a shift in consciousness, and I think Congress, uh, congressional leadership and White House leadership is really important to that. Thank you, Michelle. And, Chair, as I yield back in an indirect way, I appreciate the endorsement of the panel about the conservation provisions in the 2014 and 2018 Farm Bill. After all, we've worked since 1935 <laughs> on the land use questions to try and preserve our resources. Yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Mr. Lipinski. Uh, Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for holding this, this hearing today. The, um, it's been, been an issue. Uh, I was just talking to Mr. Perlmutter and said I've been around here for a long time. Uh, it's an issue we've been talking about, I've been active on, and unfortunately we haven't done a whole lot uh, to really address you know, climate, uh, climate change. One thing that the UN Emissions Gap Report uh, one of the opportunities that the report recommends for the U.S. is introduction of carbon pricing. And that's something that I actually uh, joined two Republicans 11 years ago in introducing a uh, carbon pricing bill. And that's something that I really think that we need to take a very good look at as a way to do this and something that I especially encourage my Republican colleagues uh, to, to take a look at as a, a market solution. We're putting a price that should, that really is there. You know, carbon uh, and all climate change gases do have an externality price that is not, uh, is not realized. And I think the government should put that on, take all that money is in the bill that, uh, and that bill I introduced 11 years, years ago, and the one I have uh, this year gives all the money back uh, uh, to, uh, to Americans, so we have that opportunity. Uh, there's also, I really think we should fund RPE to a much greater extent to help. But I also introduced a, a bill, uh, the challenges and prizes for Climate Act of 2019 to spur innovation. It directs the, Department, the uh, Secretary of Energy to establish climate solutions challenges uh, in a variety of areas critical to addressing climate change including carbon capture and beneficial use, energy efficiency, energy storage, climate resiliency, and data analytics for climate modeling and forecasting. So I want to ask Ms. Franson, uh, do you think such a prize incentive would be beneficial in spurring additional interest in the area of research and development to develop climate solutions? Thank you for the question. Um, I think, um, so you've touched on, I think, two very important tools that can be part of a um, comprehensive policy package to address climate change. Um, and and to, put, um, to put both of those in a little bit of context, um, I think uh, there are two things that we need to be doing at the same time. One is taking near-term action with existing technologies to generate very ambitious emissions cuts in this decade. If we don't do that alongside R&D and innovation at the same time, we will not solve this problem. It will be too long to wait. So we need to do both of those things, just to be very clear. Um, that being said, ultimately, we need to um, drive global emissions down to net zero. Um, we know how to do that uh, in, um, across many sectors with many solutions, but the more that we can innovate and the more that we can support R&D, the broader and, and um, more cost effective our suite of options will be. Um, so absolutely, incentives for innovation um, are a key part of this. Um, innovations uh, for uh, incentive for uh, many of the innovations that you mentioned, including um, efficiency, uh, carbon capture and storage, which we need to put on any remaining fossil fuels and industrial applications, um, and so on, to get us to zero carbon energy as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to ask Dr. Murray, um, can you comment on whether we should expect any kind of similar impacts on the Great Lakes uh, as on the oceans or any other impacts that you want to talk about that climate change is going to have on the, uh, is having, is going to have in the future on the Great Lakes? Um, that's a very good question. Personally, my expertise is not in the Great Lakes per se, but I can speak on the fact that as precipitation patterns change throughout the country, even in the interior, driven by the ocean, driven by weather, driven by other matters, the hydrology of the area is going to be changing. Um, I do know that recently the, the Great Lakes um, lake level uh, has been changing 
um, quite dramatically, um, and so on. But uh, overall, the Great Lakes are, of course, very important for our commerce and um, uh, other matters. Um, but the main driver on Great Lake change is going to be the changing precipitation patterns. Thank you. Uh, I will yield back instead of going on with my last 15 seconds. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Brooks. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I've been looking at a study entitled Fossil Carbon Dioxide Emissions of All World Countries 2018 Report, uh, and that's a publication of the Office of the European Union. So to the extent these numbers err, it's European Union's um, credit. And that report looks at a number of different countries, how much of the carbon emissions they're responsible for, and what their internal trend lines have been. And so I look at the European Union collectively from the year 1990 to 2017, and they, according to the European community, have had a drop by 19% in carbon emissions and the European Union is responsible for 10% of all world carbon emissions. So according to the European Union, they're doing pretty good. Uh, then you look at the United States of America in that same report. United States of America is responsible for 14% of all the carbon emissions. Over this 17-year period of time, the United States has had 0.4% increase in carbon emissions. Uh, that's over the entire 17-year period. Uh, since 2007, over the last decade of this report, the United States carbon emissions had dropped 14%. Uh, so it appears that the United States uh, has held its own and more recently is actually cutting its carbon emissions. Then you move to India and China. India is responsible for 7% of the total carbon emissions. Their carbon emission output has increased by 305% over that 17 years. China is responsible for 29% of the total world's carbon emissions, more than double the United States of America and almost triple the European Union. And over that 17-year period, their carbon emissions have gone up 354%. And so my question to each of you, uh, 30, 45 seconds apiece, is what do you propose to stop India and China from emitting so much carbon? Uh, Dr. McElwee? Well, the reason why we have global accords like the Paris Agreement is precisely for this problem. It's a global problem, and everybody contributes to it, and everybody can be part well, of it. Well, did those agreements force China and India to cut anything? Right. The Paris Agreement is well, primarily not voluntary. right. That's a question. Yeah, it's primarily voluntary pledges. It okay, it's voluntary. Them. So well, I'm asking, what can we do to force them to cut their carbon emissions, mm -hmm. in as much as they are the principal problems of the increases in carbon emissions over the last 17 years? Well. We can also talk about historical emissions over a longer time period, in which case the U.S. would be more responsible. But your point is exactly right, that we have tools, potentially, to help these countries reduce their carbon intensity. This can rely on exporting some of our technologies that can help them reduce carbon intensity and carbon growth. Um, but that requires us to take a leadership role. And so having us be part of the Paris Accord would Okay, I heard encouragement, but I didn't hear anything that would actually cause them or force them to do it. Dr. Murray. I'm going to pass respectfully on your question, sir. I'm not an energy specialist nor a specialist on China or India or such matters that you right. asked. Dr. Steltzer. I'm not an expert in international diplomacy, but I rarely take the approach of forcing my will on another person. I know that I can engage in constructive conversations, which I believe was the call and the ask of the meeting today. Uh, I did go to China this summer in order to understand the Qinghai Tibetan Plateau, the third pole of our planet. And what I experienced by being in China for 10 days straight with Chinese was incredible. They were okay, welcoming that's, that's, as That's a nice, but that's not answering my question. I have it limited is, it time. Is, it Mr. is building Schellenberger, relationships. Can you please give a response in the little time we have left? Uh, we should absolutely not force poor countries to stay poor, which is basically what 
that would require. I mean, moving from wood and dung to burning fossil fuels is environmental and human progress. It would be unethical to punish poor countries and force them to stick with wood and coal. The reductions in emissions in the rich world are, simple, are not done because we sacrificed, it's because we moved to natural gas. China and India will follow that same pathway by moving to natural gas, but it would be crazy and immoral right. to, prevent, to force poor countries to stay poor. My, my time has expired. Okay. I'm sorry, Ms. Franson, maybe if the chairwoman will allow you to answer, uh, you may, but it seems to me that the major problem we have is China and India, and I didn't hear any answer as to how we're going to be able to cause them to control their problem that is emitting so much carbon. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bonamici. Thank you to the chair and the ranking member, and thank you to all of our witnesses today for your expertise. We, we know that every person on the planet benefits from a healthy ocean and a stable cryosphere, and unfortunately, the, there's some dire findings in the IPCC special report on the ocean and cryosphere in a changing climate. Uh, we know that the effects are being seen uh, not only in the remote deep ocean floor, but also in the most pristine Arctic and mountain regions. But there's also opportunity the same week that the IPCC released its special report, the High Level Panel for a Sustainable Ocean Economy released another report demonstrating how we can capture the power of the ocean and estuaries for effective climate mitigation. Uh, I am the co-chair of the House Oceans Caucus and also serve on the Select Committee on the Climate Crisis. And I uh, am committed to bold science-based policies that will reduce emissions and transition us to a 100% clean energy economy. And last year, after the uh, IPCC report, um, I led uh, a group uh, introducing a resolution that supports those findings. And then also, thank you, Dr. Murray, for mentioning the uh, bipartisan blue carbon for our Planet Act, which I just introduced with representatives Posey, Beyer, and Mast to strengthen federal research on blue carbon and protect and restore coastal blue carbon ecosystems. We know that the ocean can be part of the solution. So Dr. Murray, the IPCC special report demonstrated that some of the effects of the climate crisis on our ocean, like ocean acidification, hypoxia, sea level rise, and warming waters are already locked in. So in the short term, where are the federal investments in ocean data and monitoring needed to support our frontline coastal communities in adapting to the climate crisis? And also, how can federal policy better support those opportunities for the ocean, like marine energy and blue carbon, uh, so we can use the ocean as part of the solution to mitigate the climate crisis? So thank you for that question, um, and also, uh, Congresswoman, thank you for your support in your state of Oregon, Oregon State University, with the uh, regional class research vessels right. that they are investing in through the National Science Foundation. Um, for example, that's precisely the type of infrastructure, one of the many types of infrastructure that uh, this country is doing very well to support. There are a number of infrastructure needs in the ocean observing realm to gather this critical data to address the questions that you ask, in addition to the ships and other uh, mechanical hardware type aspects. And this also refers back to um, Congressman Lipinski's earlier comments about RPE and technological advancements. The ocean community is rapidly evolving and including um, very complicated ways of, of um, uh, looking at the very amount, large amounts of data that we're looking at with artificial intelligence and machine learning. We need technological advancements in batteries because the things that we have out in the ocean, deep sea, are, you know, need power. So we need smaller batteries that are more powerful. And so innovation investments throughout the sectors are going to help everything that we need to do um, in that range. Um, regarding uh, some other aspects, um, overall, the, the, the image I want to get across here is, is that we have such high data, dense, high data gathering density on land. And you look at the tremendous advances that the National Weather Service has been able to right, make right. from federal advances, and we don't have any of that, anything near that scale for the oceans. Right. We, and That's I, the and I really we're don't going. want to cut you off, but I, I want to get a question into Dr. Seltzer as well. Yes. Seltzer. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Murray. Um, Dr. Seltzer, in your testimony, you noted that ab abrupt permafrost thaw is a sudden destabilizing process in the Earth's climate system, and that the only way to slow the process is to keep, keep the Earth below 1.5 uh, relative to pre-industrial times. 
ultimately, if we fail to reduce emissions before below 1.5, the widespread thaw of permafrost could ultimately release tens to hundreds of billions of tons of carbon dioxide and methane into the atmosphere. So you suggested that every tenth of a degree matters. Can you explain why that number is significant and what the potential opportunities are to incorporate the cryosphere into our adaptation and mitigation strategies? In 40 seconds. <laughs> In 40 seconds. A tenth of a degree, the freezing point of water is zero degrees Celsius, 32 degrees Fahrenheit. So every tenth of a degree that you go over that, you thaw something, you melt. You thaw permafrost, you melt ice. and. Um, stored carbon that is frozen is uh, carbon that isn't accessible by microbes. The work that I do in the Arctic has always been on the plant side to understand where and how plants pull carbon dioxide out of our atmosphere and put it into the soil. The microbes win every time. Um, it's basic physiology of the organisms uh, that are involved. So the second piece in probably 10 seconds was was, um, can you explain uh, what, what are the opportunities to incorporate the cryosphere into our adaptation and mitigation strategies? Snow. <laughs> I only had a second. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. My time is expired. I yield back. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Weber. Thank you, ma'am. Dr. Murray, I want to ask you a question um, in response to Mo Brooks' question that you said you really weren't an expert in, but you are an expert more so in how the climate's affected in the oceans. Is that is that kind of accurate? So uh, assuming that the percentages that he quoted from the European Union are correct, with China polluting that much, do you think that negatively impacts the ocean? Most definitely. Um, the carbon dioxide molecule knows no political boundaries. and okay. it's, uh, it's being cycled through our atmosphere, into the ocean, into okay. our plants. Well, then you might want to do a little digging on China. I want to go to Mr. Schellenberger next. Mr. Schellenberger, there are some radical <clears throat> mandates in reforms that are disguised as solutions to the ch changing climate. Green New Deal comes to mind. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> I've written about it extensively. You, you've written about it extensively. Yeah. It is estimated to cost about $39,000 per household in electricity costs alone. Factor in health care, transportation, housing parts of it, and that, sing that one single piece of legislation is estimated to cost about $93 trillion total, give or take a few hundred billion. Reckless spending, in my opinion, is not the answer. Let's use Germany as a model. They made the decision, as you're probably well aware, to phase out both nuclear and coal plants. They spent 32 billion with the B euros per year on renewable energy between 2014 and 2018. What do they have to show for it? A mere 40% of the electricity supply is now renewables and hardly any zero decrease in emissions, hardly. Massive spending is not the answer. Radical reform is not the answer. Nuclear, who knew, just might be part of the answer. Would you agree, yes or no? Absolutely. That's even better than yes. <laughs> so my question to you is this. What are the major hurdles preventing nuclear from being the cost-competitive solution in the United States? And please don't say Democrats. We're in an open hearing here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, there's, in short, the short version is it's, there's a, there's a number of factors, but one of the main problems in the United States has been that we have many utilities, and what that means is that we've had many different operators and many different plant designs. So the economics of nuclear are really simple. The way that costs come down is by standardizing the same design, having the same people build it over and over again. That's the only way we know how to reduce costs, also by increasing the size of the reactor. That's what's worked to reduce costs in France and South Korea, even in some parts of the United States. So that's a major obstacle, um, and like I mentioned, it's also been the fear of nuclear. So the way that the they've the anti-nuclear folks drove up costs was through lawsuits and and regulatory ratcheting, which delayed construction and and drove up the costs. So I, th this is why I want to warn against. I think there's a lot of wishful thinking that we're going to get some new design that's going to solve these problems, but re what really matters is a long-term commitment to building the same kind of reactor over and over again, preferably with the same construction managers. Are you aware that with the argument that the problem is storage of the waste, that's the major problem here, 
It's what we do in America. Of course, you've been, I'm sure you're watching the ongoing debacle about Yucca Mountain. I'm sure you've been paying attention to that. Did a little research, and we, there, there's many types, as you know, radioactive waste. The United States only has one facility engaged in permanent disposal of nuclear waste, the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant in New Mexico, which permanently stores certain forms of radioactive waste genera generated by the DOE during research and production of nuclear weapons. Are you aware of that? Yes. So we've got to do, get better that. We've got to come to a consensus on how we're going to handle this waste. And then we have the ultimate green energy. Would you agree? I agree, and the only, the only caveat I would add is that I think that the fear of so-called nuclear waste, which is just the used fuel rods, is again just a displaced anxiety around nuclear weapons. As an environmentalist, nuclear waste is the major environmental benefit of nuclear power plants. It's the, it's, when you go to take an environmental studies class, the first thing you learn is that the perfect environmental production methods store all of the waste at the site of production. Only nuclear does that. Solar produce, solar panels create 300 times more waste than nuclear. It's all going to go say, to landfills. Say that again. Solar panels produce 300 times more waste than nuclear. It's all going to go to landfills. Only nuclear, only nuclear contains all of its own waste product. Those, the nuclear waste has never hurt anybody, never should hurt anybody. It can all fit on a single football field stacked 50 feet high. As an environmentalist, this is the holy grail of energy production. Thank you for that. Madam Chair, I yield back. Thanks, Madam Chair. And I was hoping uh, we wouldn't get into kind of uh, confrontational conversation today in that the narrative would be positive. So let me just start with positive. So Dr. Steltzer, thank you very much for your testimony. And everybody, thank you for your testimony. Um, but you, you you talk in terms of stories or narratives, and we have sort of past narratives. What narratives do you see potentially, both good and bad, going forward? What would you like to see be the narrative? What a fantastic question to be asked in a room that has on the wall, for I dipped into the future as far as the human eyes could see and saw the vision of the world and all the wonder that could be. I see the wonder all the time. I live in the western US. You wouldn't believe how amazing it is where I live, uh, especially when there's snow on the mountaintops. And to be honest, when there's not snow in the valleys, because you get the contrast and the pop uh, of the landscape in different ways, and you know what it feels like to be someplace tucked away warm with abundant water available. Uh, the opportunities we have are to include as many voices as we can to um, work constructively together and to recognize that our choices should be ones that benefit as many as possible um, and also focus on reducing harm. One of the concerns I've had um, in some of what I've heard about nuclear is that we haven't talked yet about where the, the uranium is mined from and I live in the part of the country where the uranium is mined from. I know people who have been impacted by past uranium mining and I live in a watershed where three million gallons of acid mine drainage water came tumbling down. Uh, it is a really weird moment when your river is no longer white, it's no longer the color water you're used to water being, and instead it's orange brown uh, rust. And that was iron that wasn't and was an impactful experience for the region. And so a part of the vision for the future is where and how can we manage to minimize trauma, the trauma that's ca caused by, by this feeling of uncontrolled changes, where and how can we have more people involved? So thank you very much. I'm sure somebody else might want to answer that question too. Well, let me, let me just sort of follow up on that. I mean, I think the narrative that I'd like to see is that we recognize we got a problem. And part of the solution may be nuclear. Part of the solution is going to be efficiency. Part of the solution is going to be a whole variety of things, but it does start with a conversation. It does start with you meeting with Chinese scientists at the top of the world. Okay, that's how it works. And time is uh, of the essence. I, I think everybody on this panel agrees to that, wouldn't you? Mr. Schellenberger agree time is of the essence? Yes, I, and I hope I conveyed that urgency in my, and, in my and, remarks. And, and it isn't as if nuclear doesn't have some drawbacks because we all have seen Fukushima and you, the cost to the Japanese is untold still. Today, so there are pluses and minuses to all of this stuff. 
So, Dr. Murray, I'd like to, to talk to you for a second. I just saw, and I don't know, these numbers are just phenomenal, but uh, analyzing data from the 50s through 2019, the world's oceans in 2019 was 0 0.075 degrees Celsius higher than 1981 to 2010. And they says that's 228 sextillion joules worth of energy, which they then say is equal to five atom bombs per second heating to the oceans. So can you talk about that a little bit, about what's happening to the oceans and the increased temperature there? Yes, yes, Congressman. Um, I believe you're referring to a paper that was just recently published, um, and they document that, as has been well known, that 90 percent of the excess heat is stored in the world's oceans. So uh, they've also documented that the, um, the world's oceans in 2019 were the warmest in recorded human history, um, and that each of the preceding decades was also the warmest up until that point in time. And this is important because as the atmosphere warms, so does the ocean. And we don't have a good handle yet as to the global extent. We need to narrow those, increase our certainties on what those values are. And then we also need to understand how much more warming and where will the ocean actually happen. As the ocean warms, it expands. Warm water is a little bigger than cold water. So the heating alone of the ocean is going to be contributing to a foot or so over the coming 70 or 80 years of sea level rise, in addition to just the ice melting on land and running into the sea. We also don't understand how much more uh, heat the oceans can handle and what parts of the ocean are doing that. So the atmosphere-ocean linkage is intimate, it's profound, and it's critical to our understanding and predicting the future. Thank you very much. Thanks for your testimony. I yield back. Thank you very much. Mr. Marshall. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, my first question for Mr. Schellenberger. Certainly, I believe in an all-the-above approach when it comes to domestic energy production. How would you respond to those who believe that advances in renewable energy technologies have eliminated or will eliminate the need for energy and other traditional sources? I think, and, and thank you for asking that question, and I also would I'll address some of this to Mr. Pullmerter too, I think around the story. I think we have to understand that energy density of fuel determines the environmental impact, full stop. This is a physical process. So the, the energy density of wood is half that of coal. The energy density of a, of a, of a quantity of uranium is a million times higher than coal. So. So to the question of uranium mining, well, first of all, most of it's now in situ underground. It doesn't actually, we don't actually dig anything up. But you're having a, this, this amount of uranium, or really two glasses worth of uranium, is enough uranium to power my entire life. So, so the question is, I mean, do we really need, you know, I mean, this is the issue with renewables. Do you really need renewables if you have nuclear? Well, France did an experiment. It had 75% nuclear. It added a bunch of wind. In order to add all of that wind onto the grid, it had to increase the amount of natural gas it burned. Its carbon intensity went up. So I just think you have, I think we have to just ground ourselves in the fact that energy density of fuel determines environmental impact. Humans gradually move from energy dilute fuels towards energy dense ones. So I go back to my question. Yeah. Do you believe the advances in renewable energy technologies have eliminated or will eliminate the need for energy from other traditional sources? No, and they can't because we can't make sunlight or wind more energy dense and we can't make them more reliable, which okay. is why a solar farm takes 380 times more land than a nuclear plant. <clears throat> it's not going to change. Okay. Uh, next question also for Mr. Schellenberger. If you could comment on suggestions by recent articles that aggressive efforts to pivot to clean energy sources, such as out outlined by the Green New Deal, might dramatically increase energy prices for consumers. You know, as the obstetrician, young couple starting off, uh, that energy bill, the electricity bill, was a big chunk of, of, their in of their income. What do you think things like the New Green Deal would do to energy prices for consumers? Yeah, I mean, anything, what we know is that a significant deployment of solar and wind increased electricity prices. It increased electricity prices in Germany by 50 percent. They now pay about 50 percent more than their neighbors. We saw that in California, our electricity prices went up seven times more than the rest of the United States because of our integration of renewables. There's no mystery as to why. To integrate 
significantly unreliable electricity onto the grid, you have to have 100% backup, usually from natural gas or some other source of energy. And of course, as you point out, ener raising energy prices, like increasing the price of food, is regressive. The people that suffer the most are the poor and the working class. So anything that increases energy prices is going to be regressive and harmful to, to working class and poor people. Okay, I'll stay with you, I guess, for my last uh, question, if you would see if you would kind of agree with this um, philosophy. To me, the greatest uh, determinant of the carbon footprint of this world over the next decade or two will be the world economy. That if we have a strong world economy, we can do things like uh, provide infrastructure for natural gas. To you know, to your point, in a bad economy, people burn wood, very energy light. Uh, versus being able to burn natural gas, which is going to be more more efficient and more energy dense. Uh, do you have any comments on that concept? Well, you're you're right in the in the sense that we we move we decarbonize along with economic growth. The idea that we need to have less economic growth in order to decarbonize is not grounded in reality. It's not grounded in historical fact. It's also there's no obviously it's terrible for political economy, and that's the reason why climate change legislation, cap and trade legislation failed is because people didn't want to increase energy prices. What we saw is that the U American consumers benefited to the to $100 billion a year thanks to cheaper natural gas prices. So our emissions from electricity have been going down thanks to cheap and abundant natural gas as our electricity prices have been going down from cheap natural gas. The French are not poor. They're the most decarbonized economy in that part, or next to Sweden, the most decarbonized economy, they're not poor because they've slashed their emissions and decarbonized their energy sector. Wealth and decarbonization go hand in hand. Yeah, thank you so much, and I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Tonko. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman, for holding this hearing, and thank you to all of our witnesses. Um, climate science should inform federal action. Science and research should guide us forward and be the foundation for action. And as we know all too well, inaction is incredibly costly. Um, there is a cost to inaction. Um, so Dr. McElwee, thank you for your testimony uh, on how lands can be an important climate solution. Can you give us a sense of either the global or U.S. potential of land use to be a net sink of greenhouse gas emissions? Yeah, when we talk about land, we talk about land as being both a source and a sink. So we do generate some greenhouse gas emissions from the land sector, and we can be reducing those. But the great advantage is that sink capacity, and that is can make up for some of our emissions in other sectors. As I said in my written testimony, it can't make up for everything, but it can help us um, get to some of these targets that we want to achieve. So I mentioned, for example, that natural climate solutions can get us a, a substantial way towards um, goals of reducing emissions by 2030 very quickly. Um, and what those entail are basically using our natural resources like soil and forests and grasslands and so forth um, and reducing any emissions that are coming from there and encouraging their sink capacity. So our report talks about a number of those actions that have a substantial ability um, to bite into those carbon emissions. And so in our report, we lay out um, things that have on the order of potential three gigatons per year going up to 2050, and those include increasing um, soil carbon sequestration and includes tackling um, global deforestation, preventing that, um, land use conversion of high carbon lands like wetlands and peatlands that contribute to the problem. We lose their sink capacity. So if we do things better in terms of conserving natural lands, increasing uh, soil health, improving our agricultural lands, that's going to get us a pretty substantial chunk of carbon emissions. They're not insignificant, and they often come at low cost. That's the bonus. Thank you. And Dr. Stelzer, we often hear that the uh, Arctic is a hot spot for climate warming. In fact, in a recent briefing, I learned that rapidly rising Arctic air temperatures are thawing soil that has been frozen for millennia. And because of that, the Arctic is undergoing massive landscape scale change. Do these changes impact the ability for, <clears throat> excuse me, for land to sequester carbon? The warmer soils lead to microbi microbes in the soil using the carbon that's there. And though the plants are growing more, they can't grow 
at a rate that pulls enough carbon in to balance what is moving out from uh, the microbes using the, the, the carbon that's in the soil. The other piece of the Arctic story is, um, is a part of a lot of land, use cha of land change, and that's when places get drier, they burn, and burned places don't have the vegetation to be the carbon pump that year or the next year. Tundra landscapes can regrow. They take much longer than forests to regrow. So if we want to make the most out of our agricultural and forest sectors as climate solutions, uh, it seems to me we need to get to work immediately. Um, Ms. Franson, um, the 2019 UNEP Emissions Gap Report, on uh, which you were a lead author, describes opportunities to enhance ambition and action on the climate crisis, spe uh, specifically on the contributions of G20 members. It directly addresses the G20, stating G20 members urgently need to step up their commitments on ambitious climate action. What do you project will be the effects of other G20 nations if the United States adopts ambitious nationally determined contributions in order to meet its long-term strategy? Thank you. Um, historically, the U.S. has been able to play a constructive role internationally through diplomatic efforts engaging countries like China um, around making climate change commitments. So we saw this in the lead up to the Paris Agreement, where through US diplomacy, uh, China came to the table and committed to peak its emissions uh, by 2030. They're now on track to peak in advance of that. Um, so I think that, as well as many other examples, show that when the US is engaged on this issue as a leader, it can play a strong and constructive role um, in bringing other countries to the table and um, getting good rules in place internationally that promote transparency, accountability, um, robust market mechanisms, and so on to solve this problem. Thank you. Um, with that, Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Beard. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank uh, all the witnesses for being here. Um, you know, it's been a long time since I used the formula to convert centigrade to Fahrenheit, so it was reassuring to me as you take Fahrenheit's equal to centigrade times what nine fifths plus thirty two, water still boils at zero degree or boils at two hundred twelve degrees Fahrenheit and a hundred degrees centigrade. So that uh, I thank you for making me uh, review my background a little bit on that. But Mr. Selinger, uh, earlier this year I had the privilege of attending uh, the unveiling of Purdue's little small nuclear reactor, and they went all digital. But it would appear to provide the way for uh, big data applications and increased reliability and so on. So in your testimony, uh, you say that that if nothing changes, China will surpass the U.S. in, in um, installed nuclear capacity by 2030 and Russia by 2034. So here's my question. Could you elaborate on the investments in technologies like that we're developing there at Purdue and help give us an advantage in this global competition? as well as uh, if the U.S. develops advanced reactors or small modular reactors, uh, how much of an international advantage would that give us? And is that the type of technology that is best exported, uh, suited to be exported? Thank you, sir, for that question. Uh, what I want to stress about nuclear, advanced nuclear technologies and nuclear technologies is that they are at risk of becoming orphans without a national nuclear program, without something like a green nuclear deal. And so China and Russia are also developing small modular reactors. They're also, they're also developing non-water-cooled reactors, ones that use molten salt or, uh, li uh, or liquid sodium reactors like we've developed. So when countries make decisions about who to partner with, they're actually choosing countries based on which countries have the most experience building those reactors. As, you, as a policymaker, I'm sure you can understand, if you're looking to make a big investment with taxpayer funding, you want to go with the tried and true um, uh, management as well as design. And so my concern is that these promising new reactor technologies we're developing that we're not really going to have, we're not really set up at all to be competing with the Chinese and Russians. We need our head of state selling them to compete with Putin and Xi who are aggressively selling them. We need to have the right financing for countries. And when countries, when they say to us now, who would build this plant for us, we don't have an answer. The answer needs to either be Bechtel or, 
or some other major construction firm, and right now we sort of say to them, hey, you can pick whoever you want. When you go to Russia or China, they say, here's exactly here's how it'll work. Here's the people that will build it. Here's the financing for you to build it. And like I mentioned, you know, this is a very special technology. It's a dual-use technology. The U.S. government has always understood that nuclear, that the United States needed to be leaders on nuclear. And right now, I worry that we've engaged in a kind of wishful thinking that somehow some new technological breakthrough will make the difference when, in fact, our technological breakthroughs just aren't that different from the technological breakthroughs that we're seeing in Russia and China. Thank you. Uh, I would like to add, have you add on to that, um, you know, of the technologies that we have right now, and if we could fully develop some more of those, what's the potential for nuclear energy to supply what percentage of our energy needs around the world? I mean, I, I believe that eventually we will be 100% nuclear. It may not be for another 200 years, but it's such a clearly superior energy technology. I think that is eventually what will be. Obviously, you know, France has proven that it can be 75, 80% nuclear without any problems. We are, the United States was headed towards 50% nuclear. The anti-nuclear movement succeeded in killing half of all reactors, a little bit over half, so today we get 20%. I think it would be a perfect goal to have to get the United States back up to 50% nuclear. The market right now, China has a, uh, Russia and China have order books of about $150 billion for new nuclear builds. This is great business. This is big construction projects, high technology, well-paying jobs. It's just, I find myself um, uh, very concerned by, by the ways in which we're sort of sleepwalking into third place in this global competition. Thank you. And I see I'm almost out of time, but uh, Dr. McElwee, I would like to elaborate or have you elaborate more at some point, not now, but about agriculture because of my background in the carbon storage and cover crops and so on. So thank all of you for being here, uh, and I yield back. Thank you very much. I thank the chair, and I thank the witnesses. Uh, I appreciate your testimony and your work in the field. Uh, the planet is continuing to warm, and unfortunately, I believe that we're going to blow past the 2 degrees centigrade. Uh, while we must drastically reduce carbon emissions, uh, I firmly believe we need to explore all the possible tools uh, that we have at our disposal, and that's why I recently introduced the Atmospheric Climate Intervention Research Act, which authorizes NOAA to advance research on atmospheric climate intervention modeling and technologies. NOAA is already active in observing and monitoring atmospheric chemistry and dynamics. My bill will help them expand that effort. Uh, Dr. Seltzer, do you believe that we have the capabilities needed to accurately and fully monitor changes in the Arctic and chirosphere, particularly with regard to rapid changes or approaching tipping points? Do we have the ability to understand that yet? That's such an interesting question to be asked, thank you. Um, I mean, th I'm a scientist, so I never, I feel like I have to give the science answer, which is that we will never fully understand the complexities of our Earth. And, and you know, I apologize that that sounds like, then why try? But it's, of course, we will always try, even if we know that we're trying to solve the biggest puzzle ever. Um, and we will bring everyone to the table. So I think that where and how we move our understanding of the Arctic forward the fastest is to work collaboratively with other countries that are also working to understand the, the Arctic because some places will change in different ways than other places. It's a big, big, vast region. Um, we need to understand the land and the sea and we want to reach out to the people who've long lived there. And we want to understand where and how their knowledge systems contribute to our understanding uh, of what patterns have they seen of change. Uh, a Yupik woman once said to me while we were walking across the tundra, and the Yupik are the uh, uh, native people of the western part of Alaska, she said to me, when we lose the lakes, we lose the sky. And there is an incredible amount of understanding packed into that that um, gets at the physical, chemical, biological processes of change that happen when you lose likes across the landscape. Well, uh, how fast are, are the Arctic and cryosphere uh, changes uh, moving relative to the modeling of those changes? In other words, are the models keeping up with the rate of change? 
Um, I'm not sure. I, I'd have to get back to you on that one. I'd like to get back to you on that one. Okay. Um, this is a question for all of you. Um, given the complexity of climate system and the risks associated with further human interference, uh, would you agree that additional research is necessary to understand the stratosphere uh, and how the stratosphere is changing? Just answer with a yes or no. Yes. Dr. Seltzer? I'm sorry, I need the question to be repeated. Um, do you agree that we need additional modeling in the stratosphere? It's not my area of expertise, I don't yeah. know. Sorry, I don't know either. Neither do I. Well, thank you. Um, well, you know, the, the, uh, we were very successful in reducing refrigerant pollution using the Montreal pro Protocol over the past few decades, and they say that that resulted in the greatest reduction in radiative forcing associated with greenhouse gases of any human uh, efforts to date. So reducing short-lived but strong greenhouse gases uh, strategies is sometimes referred to as fast mitigation uh, and has the potential to help reduce warming in the near term. How adequate are investments in this sort of approach, Dr. McAwee? As I mentioned in my written testimony, one place where we can be doing a better job is on methane, which is one of our shorter lived greenhouse gases. Um, and we definitely need more research in this area. So one of the things that's been um, a subject of de scientific debate recently is trying to explain some fairly dramatic increases in methane emissions over the last decade or so. Um, and we are using different tools to do, do that. We're trying to figure out, if, are these coming from, for example, releases from fossil fuels, so fugitive methane that's coming out of fossil fuel extraction? Is it biogenic sources? Um, and so we need research on all of those areas, particularly around how our land sources may be contributing to this increase. This might be one of these climate feedbacks where we're beginning to see, for example, additional methane releases from, say, tropical wetlands that we really need to monitor and understand more carefully. Okay, thank you. I conveniently ran out of time. I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Murphy. Thank you, Madam Chair uh, Chairwoman. Uh, thank you guys for coming out today and sharing your expertise with us. It's uh, uh, very, very important that we hear from you. I just want to uh, give a few thoughts. I represent a coastal district in eastern North Carolina, and so I understand the importance of addressing this issue. Geological evidence has shown that the climate on this earth has changed for billions of years. Uh, in fact, my home state, North Carolina, Raleigh is smack dab in the middle of the state, and the geological evidence shows that the coastline was there 100,000 years ago. It happens. I mean, we've been doing this for billions of years. Um, I'm a surgeon. Uh, I'm a scientist, so I don't deny facts. We're dealing with a real issue. But I believe that, uh, you know, God created this earth. He, uh, he created it for us to enjoy its resources, but also to balance our, our ability to manage those resources. And it's important that we invest in a, a large number of alternative technologies, and nuclear, hands down, is where we need to go. Uh, my questions then run around the fact that, you know, the, the U.S. has led the world in decreasing our carbon emissions. Um, you know, it's said that we have to be the world's leader. Well, we are. The problem is that the world's worst actors, China, India, Russia, are actually increasing rather than decreasing um, their emissions. And so it's not to say that we're not making a difference, but if these bad actors are doing what they're doing, are they nullifying everything that we're doing? You know, I think an overlooked uh, issue this morning has been um, one that we need to deal with. It's called mitigation and adaption, which we as humans, that's what we do. And so, you know, a great example, the Netherlands, been there multiple times. They've lived 15 feet underwater for the last 300 years. We need to learn from them. We can't just stick our head in the sand and say that our changes are going to change everything. And so uh, I, I think that uh, we, this nation needs to look towards innovation rather than running around with our head on fire um, to actually do what we can to continue to live on this earth with five and six billion people. So with that said, just have a couple of questions. Uh, first one directed towards Dr. Seltzer, if you would. And, and this is, it's not meant to be a, you know, a, a, an animus question by any means, but if we were able today, um, uh, in the U.S. anyway, because the other bad actors are our, if we were able today to decrease our emissions to zero, how much time could we buy? I mean, with, with what's going on in the earth and what's happened for billions of years, what are we looking that we could actually buy? 
I don't know that I could give you a number on that, but I'd say that if we did what you just proposed, we would be good neighbors. And one of the pieces of the oral testimony I didn't have time to talk about is that that's one of the visions I have, is where and how can the US play a role as a good neighbor, putting forward an example that we want others to follow. And that doesn't mean zero today, zero tomorrow, but that means that we continually to do what, do what we can to decrease our fossil fuel emissions. And we support the sharing of the technology and the expertise that we have with other countries to encourage and support them in doing um, what they can do. I, I think most people want to see, uh, this, this gets at what um, Mr. Perlmutter asked me earlier, most people want to see us working together within a country and across countries and doing what we can to minimize harm to people. Um, and we just need to motivate the spaces and places where we can do that. Thank you. I, I would agree completely. The problem is we have people in this world, China, Russia, India, that don't give a, a hoot about what we're doing. And so um, we're fighting that. We're really fighting that. It would be great if, as we are a good neighbor, that they would be good neighbors too, but they're not. Um, final question to uh, Mr. Schellenberger. Can you just give a quick 30 uh illustration of fission versus fusion? And wouldn't it be great if we could get to fusion? And when are we going to get there? <laughs> I, I don't, I mean, honestly, I'm, I'm, I have an unorthodox view on this, which is that I think fusion is probably inevitable. I don't think it's anytime soon. It could be hundreds of years away. And I don't think that the advantages are all that greater over fission. I mean, fission already, we radically dematerialize, decarbonize with fission. The, uh, you know, like I said, I don't think it's a technological problem. I think it's more of a, of a consciousness problem, a fear problem, an institutional problem. Um, I still support... Uh, R&D for fusion, I just don't think it's, it's the holy grail that a lot of other people think it to be. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I'll yield back. May I come in on the China-India good neighbor question? I yield yes. my time. Yes, go ahead. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to uh, build on Dr. Stetzer's points uh, by noting that uh, since the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, the U.S. has emitted twice the carbon that China has and about six or seven times the amount that India has. Um, and I would also note that by going to zero emissions rapidly, we can improve uh, health outcomes in the U.S. We can increase U.S. competitiveness through innovation um, by building technologies for which there is coming to be a $23 trillion market around the world. Um, so this is very much in our interest. Interest. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Chris. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, I want to thank the witnesses for being here today. Uh, as all of you know, uh, my home state of Florida has been ravaged in recent years by outbreaks of harmful algae bloom. Dr. Murray, uh, can you discuss the connection between climate change and increasingly severe outbreaks of blooms such as red tide? In general, um, with the increasing population density along the shoreline and the increasing amount of nutrients that are going into the water and with the warming waters, uh, in general, the, those experts tend to predict that there'll be increasing amounts of, of harmful algal blooms. Just this past weekend, I held a red tide roundtable in my district in St. Petersburg where I brought together scientists, uh, state and local officials, business owners, other stakeholders to discuss ways to tackle this crisis. And one of the things I heard from the panel was that we could generate, if we could generate more accurate predictions of where and when blooms will occur if we had expanded observation systems. Again, Dr. Murray, um, can you discuss our current ocean observing capabilities, how they support algae bloom prediction, and what additional capabilities might be needed? Uh, harmful algal blooms by um, most measures are most impactful on us right along the coastlines. And the coastlines from the water perspective are surprisingly hard to monitor and set up long observation uh, systems in. Um, we have a fair bit of stuff that's a little further offshore, but looking at how the ocean currents are moving up and down the coast in that critical interface zone is surprisingly difficult. Um, there are some land-based techniques with various uh, imaging systems looking out to sea that are very helpful on understanding ocean circulation, air-sea interactions, but again, we need more of those. A, a large issue, um, potential answer to your question as well as to some of the ones from Congressman Murphy regarding mitigation type things along the coastline. 
you know, in terms of the physical impacts of sea level rise, but in terms of the chemical impacts of nutrients going in, we need to do a better job in our sewage treatment plants, inputs, our, our local infrastructure, which are all going to be impacted by rising sea level. I live in a coastal community in Massachusetts, um, so I'm very aware of what happens when sea level is rising temperatures are warming, and there's a whole domino effect of what's going on. It's, we can pick on algal, harmful, harmful algal blooms, we can pick on sea level rise. All these things are all related. Coastal ecosystems is storage of blue carbon as helping us mitigate inputs of, of, of pollutants and nutrients. All these things are related, chemical, biological, and uh, physical. Thank you. Uh, another thing I heard at the, the round table is that translating science from the observing arena to the operations arena can be a challenge, and the critical information can get lost in the translation. Um, how could we better move scientific data from the research and observation side to the applied side so that local officials and general public can best be informed as to when and where algae blooms will occur? There I would speak to uh, the importance of making data readily available and readily available by the decision makers of the communities and the municipalities along the shoreline. So what the predictive models are on sea level rise, where, how fast, what type, bringing in wave energy and so on. But having that data available and available in a way that people can use. So NOAA, the US Geological Survey, NASA, um, when I was advising with OSTP, we worked very hard on making sure that those agencies were communicating with each other and coming up with consistent um, data sets and, and visualizations that the uh, local city owners and ma city managers and so on could work on. But I would really focus on the, the data aspect. The uh, Union of Concerned Scientists recently released a report on extreme heat across the U.S. According to that report, the United States can expect a number of days with a heat index of above 105 degrees to quadruple by the mid-century and increase eightfold by the end of the century. For example, in my district of Pinellas County, Florida, has a historical average of one day per year above 105 degrees. According to this report, that average is expected to increase to 77 days by mid-century and 123 days by the end of the century. That's over a third of the year. Uh, Dr. McElwee, can you describe the potential impacts that a sharp increase in the number of extreme heat days will have on the economy, particularly as it relates to outdoor workers and tourism in places like Florida? Certainly, we know that extreme heat events, as you say, are projected to increase. That's, the evidence is very clear on that. Um, and so with that comes a number of health impacts. So obviously there's heat stress on people who have to work outside. Um, mortality in general goes up when we're outside. Um, uh, and so we're concerned about all of those issues. But let me also point out that what we're seeing, for example, in Australia right now with the extensive bushfires, they have had similar days. In fact, it's been over 40 degrees Celsius um, in some parts of Australia for an extended period. And those create the conditions for wildfires to start and extend. And so we have multiple things that are related to these extreme heat events, also related to agriculture. Extreme heat can have an impact on our crop yields and so forth. So there's intersecting issues, but you're absolutely right. This is one area where the science is extremely clear that we are very confident that these are associated with anthropogenic climate change. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Babin. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I want to thank the witnesses for being here as well. Um, fascinating uh, stuff. And uh, it looks to me like from what I hear, and I've read a lot of your stuff here, uh, Mr. Schellenberger, and uh, that nuclear may be the, the only way uh, that we can uh, get off of uh, the dependence on uh, fossil fuels or, or uh, because obviously we, uh, the renewables don't seem to cut the mustard. Uh, but the U.S. has always been the leader in nuclear power construction in the past uh, for safe and reliable nuclear plants. Uh, but, uh, I noticed that China and Russia are leading in the number of plant construction uh, around the world. Many, uh, many other nations are uh, kind of uh, saddling up to them in dependence uh, on, on these, these two nations when we build a better plant. So uh, if, that's the, 
if that's one of the problems, uh, what uh, the price tag of, of clean energy is so high right now, uh, at what point do you see clean energy becoming cheaper and more viable, and is it going to be uh, a reversal of the, the trend that we're seeing on nuclear here in the, in the United States? And when you say clean energy, are you referring, sir, to nuclear in specific, or are you saying um, all low-carbon energies, including renewables? I, I would say, well, I was talking specifically about the nuclear uh, end of it, because you had had so much uh, in your uh, documentation here that I was reading about, so I would say that. Yeah, I you mean, can throw key, in the other ones too. I'd like to. I'd like to hear what you have. To sure, say. I'll give you one uh, study we did where we calculated that had Germany spent the 580 billion it's estimated to spend on renewables by 2025, had it spent it on nuclear, it would already be at 100 yeah. percent zero emissions right electricity, and it would have completely decarbonized its transportation supply. Uh, similar case in California. So it's very easy to do those calculations. The, the, the challenge for nuclear is that it requires national level commitment from the top. It really requires the president to be a leader on it. It requires significant congressional leadership. I would note that, for example, Russia is also has abundant natural gas supplies. And what it's choosing to do is replace its use of natural gas domestically with nuclear power plants and export its natural gas abroad. That seems like a great recipe for energy dominance. It seems like that would be the heart of an energy dominance strategy internationally and one that the United States would do well to follow. But again, it really requires this kind of long-term national commitment. Absolutely. Uh, we, we hear a lot of extreme rhetoric uh, in fact, uh, some of us Republicans are, are uh, you know, the, the claim is that we're climate change deniers and nothing can be further from the truth. I've got a science background myself. I'm a, I'm, I'm a dentist uh, a, uh, with a biology degree and, and, and studies in, in, in science. But we're, we're told, and I, I, I can tell you that we know that the, that the climate is changing. There's no question about it. No, no district has been hit any harder than mine down in southeast Texas by hurricanes and floods. Uh, so we know things are happening. Uh, but we also uh, hear some of this extreme rhetoric. Uh, civilization will end without radical action. Children are suffering from eco-anxiety and depression. And uh, no credible science, I noticed, where, where I read where no credible scientific body has ever claimed that climate change threatens the collapse of our civilization are the extinction of homo sapiens. And uh, yet we hear politicians in the media are making these claims. I'd like to hear your opinion and uh, tell me what you're thinking about that. Thank you for asking that question. It's very troubling, the rise of this rhetoric. It's obviously been around for several decades, but it's become much more acute in recent years. What we've done is we've went and interviewed the scientists who activists told us they were relying on for those catastrophist claims. Four of the scientists we interviewed all claimed that they were misquoted. One of them told us that it was based on his best estimation that the world could not sustain half of its human population at a four degree temperature rise. We asked him what that was based on. He said it was just him speculating. In fact, there are studies by the Food and Agriculture Organization and the major factors that determine how much food we will grow, because the only way you can really come up with collapse of civilization scenarios is with a collapse of food supply that the major studies show that, the, that the, what determines food output in the future is the same thing that's determined in the past, which is whether poor countries have access to fertilizer, irrigation, and tractors. And so if we're really concerned about um, Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, or South Asia, where people are much more vulnerable and dependent on, on nature, on uh, less resilient, then we should be helping them to, to industrialize agriculture, to, in, you know, to, to urbanize, to gain access to factories. That's already starting to happen in Ethiopia. It should happen in the rest of the continent. So what bothers me is the way that this apocalyptic discourse is used to justify denying poor countries cheap baseload electricity, not just from fossil fuels, but we've also seen this effort to stop poor countries from getting large hydroelectric dams and large nuclear power plants. So what I always say to my colleagues is if you're so worried about denial, then I think you should stop trying to deny poor countries the cheap reliable sources of electricity and energy that they need in order to survive a hotter world. Absolutely. And I, my time has expired. And uh, I, for one, am very happy that uh, we had the uh, availability of fracking uh, and the uh, uh, increased production in natural gas in my home state, which is 
led to energy independence for the United States and a lowering of emissions uh, that have been very, very significant. So thank you, and I yield back. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Lamb. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and uh, I want to thank all the witnesses for coming to be with us here today. Um, Mr. Schellenberger, you're getting a lot of attention, and I, I have to say I'm very happy about that. Um, the district that I represent in western Pennsylvania is the home of the original shipping port nuclear power plant, um, the first civilian reactor built in the United States as part of the same program that led us to, to build uh, reactors for our ocean-going vessels in the Navy. Um, and in my office, I have a picture of uh, President Eisenhower waving this was actually a fake wand. Um, he, he did a little press event to show the start of the construction of that, but he was somewhere else at the time, and he waved a wand, and the first uh, backhoe or whatever started moving dirt at shipping ports. So we have a, a plant there now, Beaver Valley, uh, which is at risk of being closed. Um, you know, nuclear, in a lot of ways, the lack of support for it in our, at our federal government shows a lot of the things that are wrong with Washington. Um, in that it, it has no natural friend on, on the side of those who consider themselves the environmental left. Uh, but frankly, it also has been kind of unfairly targeted and undermined by certain fossil fuel lobbies. And in our own state, um, natural gas has become so cheap that it makes it difficult for nuclear to compete without any sort of uh, support. Um, and people make it seem like the request for support is an act, you know, a request for, a, you know, kind of an unfair thumb on the scale, which couldn't be any further from the truth. I mean, nuclear just does something that natural gas does not do, which is produce energy without carbon, and it does not get compensated for it at all. And so, um, you know, we're left with the support for nuclear being among scientists, you know, people who are neither on really the right or left, but simply the side of the facts. And so I thank you for presenting those so well today. Um, in addition to the scientific facts, I just want to point out some social facts about nuclear power, uh, which is that it employs thousands, actually tens of thousands, of veterans and union electricians and union construction workers in my state already. So we're not talking about the future potential of renewable energy, for example, to create as many jobs as it may erase. We're talking about people who are already working and earning good middle-class salaries and raising their families based on this technology, which was invented by our government for an idealistic and environmental purpose. And I know you know that, but I just want to make sure that the jobs angle is included. And to uh, my friend, Mr. Brooks, who was asking about, well, what do we do about India, China, Russia? At least with respect to India, one of the things we do is sell them nuclear energy. And you've started to point that out today, but I think on a grander scale, I've been told it's, we're looking at about a trillion dollar export market, probably maybe more, um, that will go to someone. So this is a trillion dollars worth not only of the construction workers who go to build the plant and the designers, but the people in my state who make all the parts. There's a manufacturer in my state who does about half its business for civilian nuclear reactors and half for the Navy. And when I visited, they told me this hilarious example where uh, when the Chinese come to buy replacement parts for their AP-1000s that they have, they literally have to put sheets and blankets over the Navy equipment that they're making in the same warehouse so they don't steal our naval technology. So this really exists that we have a manufacturing economy related to this. Um, and if we want to preserve those jobs and increase them by selling this stuff domestically and overseas, You've talked about the president being a salesman. Um, I think that works for the overseas market, but for the domestic market, any ideas in the minute and a half I have remaining on what we would actually do to make it economically feasible again? Is it purely deregulatory? And if so, you know, what are the couple of the, the most important things we can do? Go ahead. Uh, I, I mean, I think the most important thing is a, is a national green nuclear deal so that this is not just advocated by people that happen to have a lot of nuclear in their states or districts. Exelon, which is one of the biggest operator of nuclear plants in the United States, is seeking some sort of subsidy. My view is there should that any subsidy for nuclear should be in the context of a nuclear growth strategy. Right now, the official strategy of the U.S. nuclear industry is of managed decline. I think that's unacceptable. I don't think it's in the taxpayer interest to subsidize an industry that is committed to decline. We need to have a, we need to have a growth strategy. You're absolutely right. I mean, there, for me, 
my view is that the world will go to nuclear after we exhaust every other option, after we try everything else and we discover it doesn't work, when clearly we have this amazing technical fix in our hands, and it's one that we must take responsibility over because of the dual, dual use of the technology. So the maybe to cut it short, the government would have to show commitment beyond just changing a few rules, but purchase agreements, for example, and things that show that it, the money will really be there for a long term and the market will exist. Yeah, I mean, Senator Lamar Alexander for decades had advocated a significant scaling up of nuclear plants. It was basically the right plan. There's really not some... I think everything else is basically wishful thinking if, unless you're in the place of actually of having a really concrete proposals to build nuclear plants. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Gonzalez. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to our panel. Uh, first, I'd like to ask unanimous consent to submit the following art article titled Meet Vaclav Smeal, the man who has quietly shaped how the world thinks about energy. It's in Science Magazine. I ask unanimous consent to submit for the record this article. Without objection. Thank you. Um, so uh, one of the things that uh, we've talked a lot about in this committee is, is the issue of climate change. Uh, and I think we've actually made progress. It's sort of a, this bizarre world where in here I feel like we make progress and I get on Twitter, God forbid, and it's um, something completely different. Um, so uh, I want to start um, first by talking about sort of the transitions. And one of the reasons I like this article uh, is Professor Smill basically goes through and talks about the different transitions from energy sources, from wood to fossil fuels, first coal, then oil and natural gas. Now, it took over a century, uh, and basically um, the science is pretty clear that the next transition uh, is, if we go to full-scale renewables, will be very slow. Uh, and so these, these projections, um, some in the Green New Deal and, and whatnot, that we can somehow solve this with wind, solar, and battery um, is, is somewhat fanciful. Um, and, and that's why I've been, or, or in fact is fanciful. Um, and so that's why I've been very excited uh, to hear uh, Ranking Member Lucas's comments on the need to increase basic research um, and, and discover the answer to this question, because I don't personally believe um, that it exists, uh, with the exception of potentially nuclear. And I know, Mr. Schellenberger, we, we probably agree on that. Um, and so I, I want to start with you and your testimony I think you make a strong argument in favor of growing our nuclear capacity both at home and abroad, uh, and I certainly agree with you. Uh, we, we need to do more not only to expand our capacity but make it more affordable. Um, now, as I understand it, nuclear reactors are currently only custom built, which generates significant costs. How important is the R&D component uh, from an investment standpoint to promote advanced nuclear reactors? I, I think it's a small but exaggerated part. Okay. I'm, I mean, my views are, are I have a minority of view of this and within the pro-nuclear community. I think there's a fetishization of new designs and of that particular phase of the process. Certainly, I mean, basically, if you look even at solar panels, which have experienced a significant decline in cost, 90% decline in cost, it wasn't a breakthrough with a different design. It was actually the same boring old silicon solar panel that they just mass manufactured in big factories in China. Right. And so, so your point about scale is really, really important. What brings down the price is being able to do the same, it's just factory type production or mass manufacturing that brings down prices. And how does the U.S. currently sit from a competitive standpoint relative to uh, other nations in developing the technology? I mean, we're basically, I mean, as far as I can tell, we don't have a significant advantage in terms of new smaller reactors or, or novel designs that use a different coolant than, than water. Uh, the Russians and the Chinese are all pursuing that. The Koreans are certainly pursuing it. We see the Canadians are getting into it. I, again, I just think there's just way too much emphasis on design type because I think there's some idea that we're going to have some kind of a breakthrough in design, yeah. but that's just not consistent with any physical understanding of the technology or the history. Okay. So what would be the most helpful in terms of uh, increasing our competitiveness? We need to be building significant amounts of nuclear power plants at home. There's really no, al there's no alternative to it. So if you're uh, uh, Nigeria and you're considering who to go with and the Chinese and the Russians and the Americans come and the Chinese and the Russians are like, yeah, we're building, you know, 10 reactors in the next 10 years and the Chinese are like, we're building 20 and the United States is like, well, we're, we were building four but then we canceled two of them and we're hoping to get the two done and maybe we'll build some other kinds but we're not really sure and by the way, we don't really know who you could work with in the United States but good luck. I mean, that's just not a competitive offering. Right. Um no, I certainly share that opinion. Uh, and uh, with that, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank all of you very much for being here with us. 
Um, you've made the really good case, and IPCC continues to year after year, about the need for very deep reductions in future emissions. But I also keep reading again and again that we're not going to be able to do this without a negative net emissions, that we have so much that we've already put into the atmosphere. Um, I was the lead on the Sea Fuel Act, which got included in the National Defense Authorization, to direct the Department of Defense and Homeland Security to pioneer products from seawater. And then Suzanne Bonamici has just introduced a bill this week on the Blue Carbon for Our Planet Act, which in really pumps up federal research for the blue carbon systems. So Dr. Murray, you're, you're the woods hole, I guess. Um, can you talk just large, uh, uh, and elaborate on the need for negative emissions technologies? And even specifically thinking about underserved communities or economic justice communities, and the hard to decarbonize industries like cement, for example. To be honest, sir, I'm not an expert in those matters that you raised and regarding that. I, I can speak to you about some of the blue economy measures, which are you know very, very strong, as you just mentioned with your colleagues, and, uh, and that sort of thing, which I heartily support, because we're going to need those to be part of any equation to get us to decreasing emissions, decreasing down to negative emissions, and so on. But the specifics of cement and such matters like that, uh, I'm unqualified to answer. Dr. McElwee was looking... Yeah. We're, we're confident at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm happy to speak a little bit to negative emissions technologies. Um, I mean, we have one right now, and it's plant vegetation and trees. I mean, they do an excellent job of doing a lot of the carbon dioxide removal um, that we potentially need. The problem is to scale them up to the amount of land that we would need to make a huge dent would then introduce competition with food production and so forth. So that's why we need potentially other technologies. And so representative Representative Gonzalez just a few minutes ago was saying, where do we need basic research? Um, and this would be an area. Um, so carbon capture and storage, either direct air carbon capture um, or bioenergy carbon capture and storage are included in modeled pathways to reach 1.5 degrees. It is nearly impossible to limit our warming to 1.5 degrees without some of these negative emissions technologies. The problem is the research is not keeping up with our need for them. And Ms. Franzen, uh, we have a variety of carbon pricing bills floating around. Um, Chris Ann Holland and I have one on, uh, and, and Ted Deutsch, yet another, using the economic dividend. John Larson has one that funds infrastructure. Can you talk about how carbon pricing, how important it is, uh, and how valuable it might be to use market forces to move this? Uh, absolutely. And I'd also like to echo what Dr. McElwee said about the need for uh, negative emissions technologies and carbon dioxide removal. Um, WRI is actually doing a significant amount of research into um, technology and natural climate solutions that can generate negative emissions and would be happy to address specific questions or follow up on that. Um, I understand that Congress last year passed $60 million in R&D for carbon dioxide removal, which is a great start. Um, and our research indicates we need to scale that up to um, around $325 million. Uh, so there's a great opportunity there. Um, on to carbon pricing. Uh, carbon pricing is indeed a very useful tool uh, to help reduce emissions. Um, it's not a silver bullet. Uh, it's got pros and cons, like many other policy instruments. Um, on the upside, uh, what carbon pricing does is change the relative costs of high carbon and low carbon goods. Um, it provides incentive, incentive for businesses and consumers to shift to existing low carbon technology. Um, in terms of limitations, carbon pricing alone cannot overcome other market barriers that limit the uptake of clean technology, um, such as high upfront costs, uh, mis mismatches between um, landlord-tenant problems, things of this nature. Um, and a carbon price alone is not likely to provide adequate incentives for investment in technologies that are still a bit higher on the cost curve. Um, so it can uh, serve as a very useful uh, part of a comprehensive policy portfolio uh, to drive down emissions. Um, my colleagues at WRI also do a significant amount of research in this area and would be happy to follow up. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Stelzer, um, I, I love your Twitter handle, Heidi Mountains. Very cool. So you do all this work on mountain slopes uh, and the like. One of the things I haven't heard much today is the, the impact of eating animal products on climate change. Uh, there's a fascinating documentary out there right now called Game Changers that talks about something like 80% 
of the, our agricultural land in the U.S. is used to grow products for our uh, meat production. Uh, so my time is up. But the, the throwaway question is, why doesn't the environmental community talk more about that as a solution? So, but I yield back. So. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. McAdams. Thank you, Madam Chair and Ranking Member Lucas and our witnesses for convening here today to talk about recent climate reports and how we can combat this massive threat. I want to just highlight um, some uh, recent news, and that is uh, the report from NASA and uh, NOAA that showed that global average surface temperatures last year were nearly one degree Celsius higher than the average from 1951 to 1980, making last year the second hottest year on record and the decade the hottest decade on record. So I don't think there's any question that we need to take more actionable steps to prevent further climate change. However, there are certainly a number of ideas about how to address, address climate change and to build more resilient communities and infrastructure to brace for it. And we've heard many of those ideas from our witnesses and from uh, members, both Republican and Democrat today. Last year, the Utah State Legislature, my home state, uh, commissioned the Kim C. Gardner Policy Institute at the University of Utah to produce a changing climate roadmap for my home state of Utah to better play its part in addressing climate change. And some of the recommendations that came forward from this report include, one, reducing carbon emissions produced in the state, two, creating an air quality and climate change solutions laboratory, three, implementing large electric vehicle networks throughout the state, four, developing economic transition plans to rural communities across our state. Additionally, over 20 cities and towns in Utah, there was a recent story in the Salt Lake Tribune, over 20 cities and towns and three counties in my state have committed to getting to zero carbon emissions. So I would like to point out that we are trying to play our part in my state. So my question for our witnesses, for any of you, um, is how can the federal government both address the need for better climate policy and support our states and our local governments that are already doing this work? Hi, neighbor. Hello. <laughs> Colorado, Utah. Thank you. I really appreciate what you all shared. I feel like we don't always know what's happening on the other side of, this st of a state border even though we may travel and go to those places. So I expect you've been to Colorado and I've been yeah. to Utah plenty. Yeah. Uh, and I know how great a state Utah is. Uh, the skiing's yeah. actually better on our side. I have heard that, but yeah, nobody's but. invited me to those mountains <laughs> yet. Um, and I haven't done any research there. Okay. Um, when I come to Utah, I go to the desert country. And what I think about that we could do to help make that work better is to support the connection between people across county lines and state lines, um, for air and watershed wide. So uh, the water from Colorado makes its way to Utah. Y'all have some of your own water too, it falls on your mountains, but the southern part of your state depends on the water from my state. Uh, the air that comes into my state comes from your state and across um, from the west, from the Pacific and across, and it brings the, the water from the ocean. So where and how do we make those interstate connections? Where and how does our federal government help to facilitate those opportunities because of that interconnection between the air and the water? And when we have those conversations, the, 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 the planning can be with the resilience-mindedness. And one of the things that I want to highlight about resilience-mindedness, um, because you brought up resilience, is it's always about dispersed and diverse. So on a mountain meadow, in Colorado, the way that from year to year in variable climate cycles, that meadow always pro provides for the ranching that happens on a lot of these mountain hill slopes is because there's so many different species and the grasses are really pretty incredible. The different grass species are pretty incredible for what they can do. And as we focused a lot of conversation today on one energy system, <coughs> nuclear, I want to put forward a reminder that resilience is dispersed and diverse. And so it's not saying that nuclear can't be a part of the puzzle, but let's make sure we have lots of puzzle pieces at play. Thank you, and I want to highlight, um, um, I'll, just, uh, I'll leave more time for the remaining uh, people who have questions, but yes, um, it, it, you know, the question was asked earlier, what do we gain if the United States went to zero emissions immediately? And one thing that I would point out in our states, 
we have cleaner, better water, more water, cleaner air. And, and in this conversation about the global impacts of climate change and how can a small state like Utah have an impact on, on what's happening around the world, um, we can have an impact on what's happening in our backyard and make our lives healthier and better for the people who, who live in our great states. Um, go ahead. Uh, thank you. It was great hearing about all the things that Utah and cities in Utah are doing. Congratulations. It's fantastic. Um, I think uh, a couple of things. Um, there are um, a growing number of um, U.S. states and cities that are being very active on this issue, which is wonderful. Um, they can drive significant emissions reductions, but we know, and as you indicated, they can't do it alone. They can't get us to where we need to go alone, um, which is to... Uh, to very significant emissions cuts by 2030 and eventually down to net zero. Um, in terms of what the federal government can do to support those efforts, um, there are a number of things. I would um, harken back to uh, our earlier conversation about carbon pricing as part of, um, of, as part of an overall package. Uh, that could generate significant incentives to support those efforts. Um, certainly federal incentives and regulations um, to go to zero carbon electricity quickly, um, not only in Utah but everywhere. Um, to uh, help incentivize and support the electrification and decarbonization of end uses, um, providing support to states on building codes, um, going forward with efficiency standards. Um, those are all things that can be part of this package and support um, state and local efforts. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. I see my time has expired, and so I yield back. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Kasten. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, all the witnesses, for coming. I want to want to just start by level setting a little bit because I, I, you know, this won't be new news to the folks in the panel, but I sometimes the folks watching I don't think don't follow all the stuff as much as they should. Homo sapiens been around for about three hundred thousand years. I think culture about a hundred thousand. Fifty percent of all the CO two we have ever emitted as a species is since Back to the Future came out in nineteen eighty five. Um, uh, as Ms. Stelzer, Dr. Stelzer, as you mentioned, we got all these positive feedback loops from lowering albedo effect of melting sea ice to accelerating methane release from permafrost and these massively nonlinear shifts. And yet we remain bedeviled by the fact that we have voices that either suggest that this is a step function, all we got to do is just grow crops in Canada, or that this is linear, that it's just, eh, you know, it's slowly changing or worse, that we can just deny the whole thing is even real. And it, we struggle on this side of the room with the fact that what is scientifically necessary is so far beyond what is politically possible. And that's, that is a path to suicide. And so, you know, I think number one, I'd like to ask us all to please give as much respect to people who would deny the science or deny the urgency of the science with as much respect as we treat people who deny gravity. They've earned it. Um, number two, we cannot let the, the recognition of the urgency allow us to deny the complexity. And I get nervous that when we politicize this, we have one side saying it ain't urgent, we have the other side saying it's simple. Both of those are paths to suicide. And so I want to ask a, a, a science question and a policy question, if I could. Dr. Murray, I want to start with you. For us to be, to not have to spend the rest of our time on this planet dealing with environmental justice, we have to get back to 1985 CO2 levels because the sea levels are rising, the oceans are acidifying, heat islands in the cities are growing. That means something like 320 parts per million in the atmosphere. We're at 100 above that right now. Given, the, given as you've described, the oceans play this buffering effect of absorbing CO2 as it puts into the atmosphere, before factoring in the account that the oceans are going to burp out as we drop, how far do we have to drop atmospheric CO2 levels to get to the point where we, were, we will equilibrate at something like 320? I'm going to get back to you on that. That's a very specific question that I don't have the numbers right on hand to answer. Um, it's very clear that it would that rapidly gets into negative emission scenarios that we were talking about earlier and to get the number back. The other factor involved here is, is the long residence time of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has a 
buffering capacity on the order of like 100 years or 200 years or so. So even if we go to zero now, even if we take 40 years, 50 years, if the technology was invented today to start getting to significant negative emission scenarios, we're still going to need to adapt, to mitigate, uh, to do many of these things we're talking about under any scenario. Well, I'd, I'd, I'd appreciate it. I mean, I have I, the number, it was recently estimated to me, and I'd, I'd like to confirm this, that the number is around 280. And if, if, if taking 100 parts per million is roughly 400 billion tons of CO2, if in fact that's more like 280, that's 600 billion tons. These are, these are huge. I don't know if that's right, but I'd welcome if you could follow up afterwards with some estimate of what you think that number is. Yeah, we will follow up with that. That Level scale up. seems about right to me, but we will get that okay. specific answer for you, sir. Okay. My, my policy question is for Ms. Franzen. We, there's an extremely disingenuous argument going on about can we afford to reduce CO2. Um, it's dumb, it's irresponsible, and oh, by the way, zero marginal cost energy is cheaper. I don't care what anybody tells you. I've spent 20 years in the energy industry. De deploying zero cost energy actually lowers the cost of energy, but it takes capital. The conservative estimates of the amount we spend subsidizing the oil, the fossil fuel sector in this world is about $20 billion a year. The International Monetary Fund has estimated that the indirect and direct subsidies get close to $600 billion a year, which is roughly our defense budget, round numbers. Um, total U.S. energy spend is about a trillion dollars a year. Is it your view that the fossil fuel industry would be economically competitive against clean energy in the absence of those subsidies? Uh, no, it is not. Um, you're absolutely right that um, zero carbon energy is uh, now cheaper than existing coal. New zero carbon energy is now cheaper than existing coal in many locations. Um, those costs are coming down very quickly. Um, and certainly once you factor in uh, the external costs of greenhouse gas emissions um, in the, and, and other sources of air uh, pollution and damages that come from fossil fuels, um, uh, in the form of uh, health costs, uh, I could go on, um, natural disasters that are exacerbated by climate change, et cetera. Um, the economic case for moving to zero carbon energy is extremely strong. Um, thank you. Yeah, thanks. I'm, I'm out of time, but I just want to leave the question to all of you. With $600 billion a year of subsidies, we spend a lot of time talking about what incentives we can put in place for clean energy. It's politically easier to pass incentives than it is to remove barriers. And if any of you have thoughts you'd like to submit for the record about what barriers we could reduce, I would appreciate it. Thank you, and yield back. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from Texas, Congresswoman Fletcher. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, and thank you to the panel for being here this morning. I've really appreciated um, your insights and your comments this morning. And I want to follow up on a couple of things that we've heard today. Um, while I, too, would like to, um, to make the observation that I think there is more agreement than disagreement on climate change and the need to do something. And it seems to me, from where I come from, that the question is really how and what do we do? And we need guidance and we need help from the scientific community in helping us prioritize. I represent the energy capital of the world. I'm from Houston. We believe in climate change. We know it's real, we know it's happening, and we wanna be part of the solution. That is the consistent message from my constituents, including those who are in the energy business. And I think it's really important that as we think about solutions, we bring everybody to the table, especially the people who have expertise in delivering energy now, because that is what we all wanna see. We wanna see this planet continue for our children and our grandchildren, and we wanna make sure that we are part of the solution, not part of the problem. So with that in mind, there are a couple of things that um, you all have touched on in terms of technology, and I think that's a place of common ground across the political spectrum. I think this is a place where actually um, hearing about sort of political difficulties, there's a lot of consensus. And there are two issues that have um, come up today. Um, and Dr. McElwee, I think you were talking a little bit about direct air capture and basic research, and that is certainly an area, as well as CCUS um, is another place where folks in my community are very interested in investing. When we talk about the basic research we need, there's sort of a concept, but where would you start um, in terms of doing that research, and what do you see as kind of the science we need to be doing and we need to be encouraging from a policy level, enabling, whether it's through the Office of Science or other places, to, to bring that um, project faster. 
let me say at first, most of my experience with negative emissions technologies is around the land sector as opposed to direct air capture, but they're both very promising, right? So um, no doubt that we need to move in this direction. I mean, one of the barriers is, of course, that there's no penalty for emitting carbon. Right? And so until we figure out how to internalize that externality, it becomes very hard for the private sector, for example, to invest in some of these um, very large scale things that we're going to need. So it's going to need to be a partnership of multiple mm -hmm. things where we can bring industry folks on board, but we give them the incentives to do that through, say, carbon pricing or something else. Um, certainly we need more um, partnerships with our universities. There's some really interesting things, for example, at Rice University right now, um, looking at the land sector in terms of of getting more money to our ranchers out in East Texas who are doing a great job of conserving soil carbon and improving vegetation on their lands, that actually helps with flooding uh -huh. as well, right? So all of these systems are connected. So if we're worried about resilience downstream and in urban areas, those sorts of projects um, are what we need to be looking at as well. So it's not always sort of fancy, shiny new technology, but it's doing things better that we know we can do. Thank you for that. Um, and I am familiar with some of the suggestions coming out of the Speed Center and other, and other folks at RISE who are working on some of these ideas where there really is a connection. And I think that that's what many of us who are lay people, not scientists, are, are looking for. And so I think, um, I think uh, you also mentioned in your testimony, and I'd love to hear what the time we have left from each of you, um, that there, uh, Dr. McElwee, you said in your written testimony, one of the findings of our work, there are a lot of actions we can take now. Um, and so I think if each of you wanted to just tackle that, what do you think is sort of the, the first thing or a thing that we could do now um, that would be useful for folks to, to understand kind of your, I don't want to say your top priority, but just one of the many things that's right in front of us um, that would be helpful to get your perspectives. Dr. Murray. So I, I'll answer that question also by drawing attention to your an agreement, your point about there's more agreement than disagreement. And I just want to draw everybody's attention to the um, memorandum for the heads of executive departments and agencies from OSTP from the current administration, the current administration. And they talk about many things in the science priorities for the coming fiscal year, 2021. But one of the sections is American energy and environmental leadership, some of the things we've all been talking about here today. And they, and they identify three areas of interest. One is energy, which we've certainly talked about a lot here today. Um, the other one is oceans, OK? And what's all oceanographic? I just got to point that out. But they also talk about prioritizing new and emerging technologies. They talk about batteries. They talk about things like that. But then the third thing is earth system predictability. And that's earth system. So not just oceans, but land everywhere. And they're talking about prioritizing R&D to quantify um, different time scales, different geographic areas. They talk about artificial intelligence, adaptive observing systems. These are areas that I think throughout our our technological sectors, throughout academia, throughout our national labs, are bipartisan, um, but more agreement than disagreement. So those are the sorts of things that I would be, if I were in your shoes, um, really looking to capitalize on. Many of them that are in this OSTP memo and some of these other things through the years, different administrations, different co different congresses. Thank Terrific. You. Thank you so much. And I have actually gone over my five minutes. Um, but for the rest of you, if you um, want to submit a response on the record, I think I can anticipate some of them. But really appreciate hearing from all of you this morning. It's been incredibly helpful. Thank you. And I yield back. Chair recognizes the gentlelady from... The great Virginia. Commonwealth of Virginia. Loudoun County, Virginia. Ms. Wexton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to all the witnesses for coming and, and sharing your knowledge with us today. Um, just outside of my district in Northern Virginia is the Smithsonian's Conservation Biology Institute, and they have done absolutely incredible work in conservation and biodiversity. Uh, they have brought species that were nearing extinction back from the brink, and they're conducting groundbreaking research on how ecosystems are impacted by climate change and also helping to advise on sustainable development. Uh, Dr. McElwee, in your testimony, you talked about uh, sustainable land use and how that management is an important part of helping us adapt to climate change and the impacts that we're feeling from that. Um, can you explain a little bit, are there economic benefits to it as well, and can you explain some of those? Yes, yes. The Smithsonian Center in your district is fantastic, um, and you're really lucky to have it. One of the things I think we haven't emphasized enough here today 
are the interconnections of biodiversity. So many of the climate impacts that we're already seeing are about species ranges changing and species having to do different things. So we want to make sure we connect that back to talking about impacts because they're crucially important. In terms of sustainable land management, one of the great things about a lot of our improved land practices ranging from cover crops to no-till and so forth is they're fairly low cost or they might have a, a small upfront cost, but then the payback comes in year two and three and four and so forth. And so the economic benefits can be considerable. But again, we need to have a balance of incentives to make that happen. So right now, for example, our farmers and ranchers that are doing a better job of conserving carbon on their lands, either in soils or vegetation, they don't get rewards for that. There's, there's essentially the benefit for their own productivity. But on top of that, all the benefits they're giving to the rest of us in terms of conserving carbon, they're not getting economic benefits for. So things like carbon pricing, maybe incentives and subsidies around soil conservation and vegetation conservation, that would make it even more economically profitable to do those sustainable land management practices. And related to that, we also, you know, in Virginia, we're a part of the Chesapeake Bay Watershed Agreement. And we're very fortunate because we have buy-in from the states, the localities, you know, everybody in the region understands the importance of this unique resource that we have. Um, but other areas are not so fortunate and don't have necessarily the same uh, resources or same buy-in. So what are, do, would you say that those tools about incentivizing good behavior and incentivizing these sorts of agreements also would apply in cases like those? Yeah, absolutely. If you look at the states that have the highest percentage of agricultural lands under cover crops, it is precisely Virginia's and Maryland's, right? Because it's about the downstream co-benefits having to do with um, nutrient runoff and so forth into the Chesapeake. And so because you have agreements and regulatory standards, as well as voluntary measures, that has increased the um, incentive for farmers and other folks to, to take this seriously. So there are other places that could do that. For example, my home state of Kansas, um, the amount of our croplands that are under cover crops is something on the order of less than 5%, whereas in Maryland, it's close to 50%. So there's huge discrepancies between the states, and that comes down to this question of incentives and how do we make this balance of regulatory standards plus incentives to achieve those co-benefits like water management, um, clean water for drinking, biodiversity benefits, and so forth. But we can't just use one side of the ledger. We have to do the incentive as well as the, the requirement. OK. Very good. Thank you very much. And I will yield back the balance of my time with that. Thank you very much. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Tennessee, Congressman Cohen. Thank you, sir. I missed the earlier part of the hearing. Did anybody talk about the effect of climate change on human health? A little bit, uh, Dr. McElroy. Uh, I was, my staffer was saying about how they, I was saying what issues might be pertinent to Memphis. And it gets hot in Memphis and all through the South. And the South is known for a lot of kidney stones and the, 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 the heat belt, the stroke belt. As it gets hotter and hotter, people drink more tea and get more kidney stones. What are the different illnesses and maladies that will beset people because of climate change that you have ascertained? I'm not a health expert, but based on the national climate assessment that came out last year for the United States, certainly heat waves, and that's what we had talked about with Representative Christ earlier, um, we know that heat waves and extreme heat events are going to increase as our emissions and our temperatures continue to rise. And so there are a number of health effects that are associated with those heat events. Um, and they certainly tend to be exacerbated in urban areas where we have urban heat island effects as well. So certainly that's an area where the the um, human health effects and so forth, the damages around that need to be weighed. We've talked a lot about, well, what are the costs of action? I really want to emphasize there are a lot of costs of inaction, and those include the health impacts of these extreme events that we're increasingly seeing, and our national climate assessment points out that it is really the southern region that is going to be seeing those um, as we move forward. Yes, ma'am. 
Uh, the other angle that I would speak to on that, and I, I agree with absolutely everything that Dr. McElwee said, um, when we're talking about uh, health and climate change, it's not only the health impacts of climate change itself, um, but the health benefits that we can derive by getting off of fossil fuels, um, and in particular, air pollution um, and all the health impacts that stem from that in terms of asthma, heart disease, et cetera, um, are, pose very serious both human and economic costs. Um, one analysis that I'll mention um, that WRI was involved in found that uh, measures to cut U.S. emissions about in half by 2030 uh, would actually generate up to around $56 billion uh, in health benefits uh, in 2030, primarily as a result of avoiding air pollution. Great. Thank you. Did, is it Heidi Mountain? It is. <laughs> I love that that's happened here, too. It's easier in the mountains. Everybody's ready to gravitate to it's that. It's fire's fault. It's not <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was just going to share that uh, there's the direct effects when we think about it's a hotter, drier planet, and then we have to recognize all of the ecosystem level changes, the atmospheric changes that go along with that, and it's hard to trace everything that goes back to how healthy is any one human or communities at large. Resilience says we want to put health first and foremost and take care of people, uh, and so that's an important piece. Uh, so if we have a warmer, drier planet, then we have more fires. And when we have more fires, we have air pollution. And we also have a loss of feeling of control. And what we haven't mentioned yet, and this isn't my expertise, but it ties into mental health. And so much of our human well-being depends on where and how we feel um, about what we do and don't have control over in our world. Let me go from there. You People first is a great idea, but animals second, and, and the fires in Australia and koalas. Uh, Darwin made it to uh, Australia, didn't spend a lot of time there on the Beagle or getting off the Beagle, but he did think about evolution when he was there, when he saw the platypus and thought about the, and, and some other animals there that seemed uh, obscure. Than, and this unique area had such unique uh, animals. Uh, what, what are we possibly losing in the terms of extinction? I mean, th there's some effort to put ko koalas on the extinction list. Are there other little tiny little varmints that might have disappeared? I have to say I've read the news a lot since the fires got big and vast. Uh, they name a lot of unique species that I don't know well even though I've been to Australia because as you mentioned they're small or they're unusual. What I can tell you is that it's incredible to go someplace and see an animal that doesn't look like anything you could have even imagined. Wombat They've been on the news a little bit, not as much as the koalas, and that's because species differ in their capacity to keep themselves safe. Kangaroos are less impacted because they ran away. Koalas are slow and have a very unique food source. They're kind of stuck. Wombats dug underground. That's where they live, is underground, and so they weathered you know, the, the, the firestorm, literally, uh, across their habitat, and now they're struggling for food. So, uh, you know, some of the relief efforts that are going to Australia in care of animals is where and how can you provide food and water to animals that can't get to accessible food and water, and that's something that, you know, people in America can help contribute to. Yeah, Australia has a, it's a unique area for uh, uh, it, its flora and its fauna, and, 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 and it's, some of it's jeopardized. If I can have a few extra minutes, since there's nobody here to... to Thank you, sir. Uh, climate change, important, serious, top of the chain. Technological advancements that threaten the environment, too, like plastic and the large amounts of plastic that's floating out there in the Pacific Ocean and that interfere with birds and fish and eating and killing and dying and blah, blah, blah in Midway Island. Anybody got any experience on plastic and what we, yes, sir, please. Given that you're from Tennessee, I'd just like to draw attention to Eastman Chemical Company. In I'm Tennessee. from Memphis. It's just about a different part of the world. <laughs> I'm from Boston, so. You're closer Tennessee, to Eastman I'm closer. than I am. Yeah, exactly right. <laughs> but anyways, uh, there's a lot of interesting in, uh, industry academic partnerships, and we're learning more as and more as we can about plastics in the ocean and microplastics in the ocean. We truly don't have agreed upon definitions of, of how small a microplastic is or how big it gets before it's something else. We don't understand the physical transport of it. We don't understand how it's transported down into the deep sea. We don't understand how one company's plastic might be differ, different from another company's plastic in terms of how it degrades or is preserved in the environment. 
environment. So we're still, like many things in ocean sciences or land sciences or energy sciences, we, we are still in many ways in the gathering information mode. And particularly in the oceans, we don't know what's out there. We don't understand how it works. So we could talk about oceans and human health, which is a NSF, NIH jointly studied, uh, jointly supported program. They are interested in the impact of the oceans on human health. We don't understand back to plastics, how plastics propagate it up the food chain or downward, which is why my you know, singular recommendation to you folks as my written testimony is we need more ocean observations. We need more terrestrial observations. We need to get that data there that you folks can then use to write informed legislation that makes sense. It makes sense financially. It makes sense um, socially, but also makes sense in that it's going to work. It's going to actually be targeting the right thing. And I think that's a listening to this conversation here today. That's a unifying thing that I see um, coming for. Here. Could I add one thing to your question? Sure, please. The, the, the one thing we do know is that what determines whether or not significant amounts of plastic waste make it to the ocean is whether or not a, a nation has a waste collection and management system. So we know that most of that plastic waste in the ocean is coming from countries that don't have waste collection and management systems, and the countries that don't have waste collection and management systems are poor countries. So it's another kind of case of why we need economic development. But even we have waste collection systems, if we don't get rid of single-use plastics, and I commend my chair for having these glasses and, and, and water that we can pour rather than continue to use these single-use plastics, which so many of the committees do, which is just, just awful to watch and witness. Uh, but we've got to get rid of single-use plastics or we're going to continue to, to, to spoil our environment, I mean, and, and kill animals. Yeah, but we need, we need waste management collection systems to prevent that plastic from going into the oceans. This is the major finding of the Jamback study from 2015. Well, that's true, but if we don't have all that plastic because we have, don't have single uses, we have yeah. less need to do that. But beyond that, I want to talk to you anyway. Yeah, okay. You talked about <laughs> Senator Alexander, and he's my friend, and he might be for witnesses and be for common sense and the Constitution and fairness and justice and all those things. But he's not necessarily in favor of, of Belafonte being redone. And you know Belafont in Alabama, do you not? I do. And there, there's a private group called Nuclear Development that wants to develop Belafont, and they want to do it privately and think they can do it. Uh, would that not be something we need to pursue and that's uh, maybe where Lamar has a little error in his uh, otherwise stellar <laughs> record on nuclear? P possibly, although my, my big point on nuclear is that we need a national nuclear strategy, and so we've got to get away from this hodgepodge potpourri nuclear and to have something approaching what we were doing in the 50s or something that's much more similar to what the Russians and Chinese are doing. Otherwise, it's just a kind of every day some new nuclear project that we kind of project our hopes onto, but it's not, you know, it's not actually a plan. But do we... Like, do you, do, you, do you know anything about the Belafonte plan? Do you, do you know how practical that is? I mean, they've got some experts from Canada working on it. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm the most pro-nuclear person I know. So, I mean, I'm in favor of doing more nuclear, but I'm here to say that I, I, I've, we've had decades of people being like, why don't we try this, why don't we try that? And that's not a plan. The Chinese and Russians have a plan. And if we're, if we're ready to cede this dual-use technology to the Russians and Chinese, we should make that decision because right now we're just – well, that, that's, into that's, it. Uh, that'll be close out of that. I'm happy to hear the Russians have a plan because if the Russians have a plan, then Trump will have a plan. <laughs> <laughs> I yield back the balance of my time. And the balance of the, uh, Mr. Ranking Member, sir? I would just note uh, in my observation that one of the things that I'm most enamored with about Memphis is the awesome barbecue, and thank goodness for that uh, beef barbecue and pork barbecue and chicken barbecue and all those wonderful things that you produce. You're welcome. Yield back. Move to adjourn. <laughs> before we adjourn, Mr. McAdams had mentioned uh, a special NOAA report. So before this hearing comes to close, I'd like to submit for the record an announcement from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and NASA that just came out at 11 a.m. this morning. Separate analyses from NOAA and NASA have both concluded that 2019 was the second hottest year on record for the Earth, falling just behind 2016. The average temperature of 2019 across the Earth was 1.71 degrees Fahrenheit above average. And further, NOAA finds that in 2019, the ocean heat content was the highest in recorded history. 
So without objection, we'll submit this for the record. And before closing, I want to thank the witnesses very much for coming and testifying before our long hearing today. And the record will remain open for two weeks for additional statements from the members and for any additional questions the committee may ask of the witnesses. So without objection, the witnesses are excused and the hearing is now adjourned. Thank you, Frank.